Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where we have unusually in-depth conversations about the world's most pressing problems, what you can do to solve them, and how to get one in 20 of your experiments to have a p-value below 0.05. I'm Rob Wiblin, Head of Research at 80,000 Hours. Spencer has been on the show twice before. Uh, For episodes 39, Spencer Greenberg on the scientific approach to solving difficult everyday questions, and episode 11 on speeding up social science tenfold and why plenty of startups cause harm. Both were much loved by subscribers, so it was a no-brainer to get him on to talk about the many new things that he's been thinking about and working on since 2018. Today we talk about a ton of different things, including whether or not papers with lower p-values are more likely to have real findings, why something called importance hacking might be about as important as p-hacking, Spencer's project to replicate all the social science papers that get published in the journals Nature and Science, whether published social science research is getting any more reliable than it used to be, in what situations you should and shouldn't use intuition to make decisions, trying to model out why some people succeed much more than others, the difference between soldier and scout altruism, a paper that studied dozens of methods for forming habits and why Spencer disagrees with how it was presented, an experiment that Spencer and his team have run to see whether a 15-minute intervention could make people more likely to sustain a new habit uh, as far as a month or even six weeks later, the most common way for groups with good intentions to break bad, and Spencer's mostly guilt-free approach to life uh, and doing good, which he calls valuism. Some of Spencer's colleagues have developed a memorization tool called ThoughtSaver, uh, and this episode comes with two flashcard decks made using ThoughtSaver that might make it a bit easier to fully integrate the most important ideas that we talk about into your deep knowledge. The first deck covers 18 core concepts from the episode, and the second one includes 16 definitions of unusual terms that we used. So if you'd like to give those decks a go, uh, simply click the links to them, which you can find in the show notes, or you could check out ThoughtSaver in general at thoughtsaver.com. All right, without further ado, I bring you Spencer Greenberg. Today, I'm again speaking with Spencer Greenberg, who was last on the show back in 2018. Spencer is still an entrepreneur, and he founded SparkWave, an organization that conducts research on psychology and that builds software products with a psychology focus, such as apps for mental health uh, and technology for speeding up social science research. He also co-founded clearerthinking.org, which offers more than 70 free tools and training programs that have been used now by over a million people. Uh, And those are designed to help improve decision-making and reduce biases in people's thinking. Since we last spoke, Spencer has become a competitor of sorts with his own podcast called Clearer Thinking, where he interviews people about all sorts of different topics. Um, and he's also become kind of a kind of a big deal on on Twitter, uh, where his handle is Spencer Greenberg with the uh, with the second E in Spencer missing. Uh, why why is that, Spencer? <laughs> Unfortunately, my name is one character too long for Twitter. <laughs> Sounds like a tech company where you've got to get a drop, drop one of the mouse. Uh, anyway, uh, Spencer's background is in mathematics, and he has a PhD in applied math from NYU with a specialty in machine learning, uh, especially uh, relevant today. So uh, thanks for coming back on the podcast, Spencer. It's really great to be here. I'm so excited to have this third conversation with you. I feel really grateful. I hope we're going to get to talk about smart decision making and valuism. Uh, But first, um, I feel like you have a hand in so many different things, Spencer. Uh, Sometimes I kind of actually I find it a little bit uh, hard to keep track because so many people in my social circle say that they're collaborating with you uh, one way or another. Is it possible to give us a kind of moderately comprehensive list of all the projects that you're helping out with one way or another at the moment? Yeah, so I don't usually talk about projects that we're not close to launching, but I'm happy to talk about projects that are already launched or almost launched. So we can kind of go through a few of those if you want. Yeah, yeah, no, that's totally fine. Great. So first of all, we have Clearer Thinking. So it's a website with lots and lots of free training programs and tools. Each of them is interactive, and you can use them on our website right now at clearerthinking.org for decision-making, habit formation, many other topics. Then we have a newly launched project called Transparent Replications. The idea is a little crazy. Uh, What we're trying to do is take the two top most prestigious general science journals, which are Nature and Science, And whenever they have a new psychology or behavioral science paper, we want to go quickly replicate it to see if it replicates as a way to shift incentives. And we're going to try to do that with more than 50% of the new psychology and behavioral science papers coming out in those journals. I also have the Clear Thinking podcast, as you mentioned. Um, Then we have Mindies, which is our app for helping people with anxiety. And we're especially uh, focusing on panic attacks right now. We also have ThoughtSaver, 
which is a tool for helping people learn and remember everything they learn. So the idea is so many of us spend our days learning things and then we just forget most of it, which is ridiculous. So Thought Saver is trying to make it easier to remember all the important things you learn and change your behavior through the things you learn. Then we have Guided Track, which is a platform for building behavioral studies, surveys. It also lets you build entire apps. Um, so it's actually a new programming language designed for non-programmers. It helps you rapidly build things in the behavior change space. We have Positively, which is a platform for recruiting people for studies. So it actually allows you to recruit people for your studies in over 100 different countries. Um, and we have lots and lots of quality control measures we have in place to try to improve the quality of participants you recruit. Then I'll just mention two projects that are not yet launched, but are coming soon. One is our intelligence project. So we're aiming to replicate more than 40 claims in the academic literature on intelligence and IQ to see how well they hold up. Like, is it really true that, you know, IQ is this big thing that predicts so many things? Well, we're going to try to find out and we're going to test a lot of auxiliary claims around intelligence and IQ as well. And then we have a meditation project that we're launching soon. The idea is we went and tried to figure out all the different meditation techniques that exist. Of course, it's impossible to collect them all, but we were able to find over 150 of them. And then we tried to build a categorization system for them. And we're going to launch this website that helps you explore all these different meditation techniques and understand them at a, at a high level. Okay, so I feel a little bit justified in uh, finding a little bit hard to track all these different projects. Because what's that? Uh, seven or eight of them. How, how big are the teams on these different projects? Generally, quite small. At the smallest, one person, but usually, like typically, like somewhere between two and eight people per project. So we, we operate with really small teams. Yeah, yeah. Listeners who are, whose interest has been picked by by some of those, uh, we'll be happy to know that we'll get to. I think I think about half of them are going to come up in the in, in the questions that I've got for you today. I suppose I'm always kind of impressed by how much it seems like you're you're managing to get done. But maybe to to balance my perception, and include some stuff that might be less obvious. Are, are there any projects or things you've done that have struggled the last few years, or stuff that hasn't panned out as you hoped? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So I'll give you an example of of a totally failed project. So I had this idea that using automated participant recruitment, we could help people build better websites and products. So the idea was, imagine you could point at your website and say, make this better, figure out how to make this better. And so what we would do is we'd automatically send a whole bunch of people to your website, and then we'd ask them a ton of questions, and we'd build this report that sort of analyzes your website and how to make it better. And I think it actually worked pretty well. It would often find like problems with websites and stuff like this. And we just couldn't sell it to anybody. It turned out to be a terrible idea <laughs> because what would happen is the really large website developers, they actually would outsource their work. And so they had no desire to like have this report themselves. The companies they outsourced it to, they didn't want it because you could tell them that their work was wrong and they wouldn't be able to tell their client everything they're doing is amazing. And then the small websites turned out they don't spend any money on optimizing their website. They don't even do basic things. So we, we just like couldn't find anyone to sell it to, even though I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it's kind of funny that there's um, you, you're stuck in the middle and there's no one for whom this is appropriate. No, no middle-sized customers. I know. It's like surely a magic button to help you improve what you're doing would would be good. No, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> good, good um, any, any other things that didn't pan out? Oh, I mean, you know, I, I try to have more failures in my life than most people ever try at anything. That's kind of my goal. Um, because I, yeah, you know, I just think when you're if you're trying easy things, obviously you can succeed over and over again. But if you're trying hard things. Presumably, you should be failing a bunch. I love that, you know, you'll, you'll see these like reports from the government. They're like, we're funding all kinds of innovative, high-risk research, and 80% of them succeed. You're like, what? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I fail on lo lots of micro things all the time. Like, you know, blog posts I'm really excited about that I spent, you know, tons of hours on, and then just like nobody likes it. And just, you know, so yeah, lots of failures. Yeah. All right, let's push on and talk about problems in social science research, at least uh, as it's done today. I mean, obviously, you've thought a ton about this because you're involved in so much nuts and bolts of psychology uh, research yourself. I imagine that the audience to this show will be aware of kind of the widely acknowledged issues here, like p-hacking and publication bias, which make it hard to just take the results of empirical uh, academic papers at face value because these have been uh, you know, huge topics in recent years. But I was kind of alarmed to discover that people were worried and talking about these things as early as the, as the 70s, at least. And yet they don't seem to really have been, have been fixed that much. I guess the, um, the, the bottom line outcome of all of these problematic research uh, practices is that when people have tried to uh, replicate scientific papers, they've generally found that the only half of the time will they find the same effect if they basically try to do to do the, the same experiment. 
for people who, who haven't engaged a lot with concerns about this, uh, a really good book that um, goes over the, the basic issues and describes some possible solutions is um, Science Fictions, How Fraud, Bias, Negligence and Hype Undermine the Search for Truth by Stuart Ritchie. I also, I also have a podcast episode with Stuart talking about this, if you're curious to check that out. Oh, yeah. Do, do, do you want to say the episode number? Yeah, it's episode number 141. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I've been hearing people wring their hands about this for all of my adult life, more or less. I kind of, yeah, concluding that scientific research in so many fields is is hardly reliable and you need to really almost be in the social loop to know like which results are real and which ones are, are bogus. But and I'm not even sure whether things have gotten better over the last 15 or 20 years. So I, I'm feeling a little bit despondent and, and weary of the, of the whole thing. What do you think the state of play is these days regarding, I guess, this sort of social science reform movement? Yeah, it is kind of uh, depressing reading papers from the 70s and be like, well, yep, they're pointing out all the things that need to be fixed. <laughs> um, I guess we didn't do anything about that at the time, and now the chickens have come home to roost. Yeah, no, I, I think we still have a long way to go to make science better, very long way to go. However, I do think there are glimmers of hope. So one thing I'm seeing, and this is just kind of anecdotally, is I see more data being shared. I see more researchers being like, here's my data, go check it out. And also more material sharing as well. Like here are the materials I use for the study. The open science framework has been a really positive force where they really are encouraging people to share their materials in an open way. It's kind of a nice platform for helping you do that. So that's really cool. I think there's more replications happening, way more replication projects where people are going and trying to replicate results. So that's really great. There's also this idea of registered reports. Uh, Chris Chambers has really been an advocate for this. And they're quite an, an amazing idea where basically... They get journals to agree to accept a paper before the study has been run. So basically, they, the, the journal knows exactly what the, the study is going to be, but they don't yet know the results, nor do the researchers. The journal agrees to accept it, and then the research team goes and runs the study, and it gets published regardless of whether it's positive or negative result. And this is really nice because it reduces the incentive to p-hack your results just to show some cool result because your papers already get published either way, right? So, so that's really nice. And, um, and yeah, and I would just say just generally more awareness, like the increased skepticism is probably helpful because it means people know they're going to be scrutinized a bit more for the research methods. Yeah. Okay. So there's, so, so there's some, some like real improvement here. I guess, what's, what's the thing that's blocking bigger improvements? Uh, and, you know, us getting to the point where, uh, you know, imagine I would read a, I would learn about a research result that came out in science and I'd be like, wow, that's probably true. <laughs> What do we have to do to get there? <laughs> yeah, I think currently something like 40% of papers in top social science journals don't replicate, but it's pretty dependent on what field it is. And I think we should, I mean, I think ideally we should get that down to something like 15%, not replicators, you know, something that, you're never going to get to zero because there's going to be, there's always kind of things that could happen. It could be just bad luck or weird chance or stuff like that. But I think, I think it's just significantly too high a replication failure rate. And the basic answer is that it's an incentive problem fundamentally, but I think there's, you know, that is sort of like the super high level answer, but there's like interesting things to unpack there about, well, what would it mean to make better incentives? But at the end of the day, if you're a social scientist in academia, you need to get publications in top journals in order to stay in the field and to get those tenure track roles and eventually to get tenure. And if you can't get published in the top journals, you basically will get squeezed out. So there's kind of a double incentive whammy here. One is that, if you're kind of doing fishy methods, you might have a competitive advantage over people who are really playing fairly, right? Because maybe the fishy methods let you publish more often. So that's really, really bad. And the second thing is those, uh, eventually you're going to end up with a field that's gets filled with the people that are doing the fishy methods. And then that becomes a norm, right? It's like, if you see other people doing fishy things and you're like, I guess that's how research is done, then that's obviously going to have a negative effect on the whole field. And so one thing that's really great about the kind of open science movement is it's by pushing back against these norms, it's like trying to create a new set of norms, a better set of norms. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, it's such a, an incredible case of kind of interlocking incentives where like no individual actor is malicious, but anyone who doesn't play along with this bad game is at risk of getting edged out of the field. So any academics who decide to be incredibly scrupulous and not hype their results or not allow potentially a false positive to get published, they run a very high risk of getting forced out of their job, uh, you know, not, not, or not getting their next job or not getting into the field in the first place. The journal editors would like, uh, you know, to have interesting experiences 
exciting results in their journal. And maybe if they're publishing stuff that's too boring, they'll lose their job. Uh, you know, people who run academic departments, if, if they can't hire staff who are regarded as prestigious and have publications in top journals, then maybe they'll lose their directorship <laughs> or just be regarded as, as lame. Uh, and so it's very like, how do you change all of these incentives simultaneously? It's very, very tricky. It's very tricky. I was talking to an academic friend of mine, and he was saying that every academic has sort of their line in the sand of p-values. Like, yeah, do you just want to um, remind everyone in very broad terms what p-values are? Yeah, and p-values are just constantly confused. Even people who think they know what they are, like, get, stumble on them. So loosely speaking, the idea of a p-value is that the lower it is, the less likely your, your result is to be due to chance or luck. The higher it is, the more likely it is to be due to chance or luck. But that's like a very loose approximation. More precisely, it's the probability that we get a result at least this extreme if there was actually no effect, right? So it's a conditional thing. Like in a world where there's no effect, how likely would you be to get a result that's at least this extreme? That's the p-value. Because, you know, you need p less than 0.05 to publish in most journals. So some people, if they don't get p less than 0.05, they're like, okay, it failed. But other people are like, well, it's p equals 0.1. There's probably some way I can get it below 0.5, right? And so like where other people are like, p equals 0.2, that's almost p equals 0.1, which is almost <laughs> p equals 0.5, uh, you know? So it's like, you know, there's this internal, like different willingness to kind of push the boundaries. And then unfortunately, because of the way the human mind works, we're incredibly good at rationalizing. So I just think there are not that many researchers who are like, I know my research is bullshit, but I'm publishing it anyway. I think, you know, there's a little bit of that, but I think by far the more common thing is, I know my research is sound. I know that my results are true. Does it really matter if I make a peak equals 0.07, get pushed below 0.05 so I can publish it? Because I know this is, this is overall good work and I know that this is overall right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, yeah, there's so much room to, to fiddle things without obviously being malicious or obviously necessarily uh, doing something wrong. Exactly. And, and, you know, and I probably should have removed that outlier anyway. I just didn't happen to think of it until I saw my p-value was, wasn't less than 0.05. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I guess if you're saying so 60% of the time the, the papers replicate, so like uh, reasonably often people are uh, right, right about that. It's just that, that a non-trivial fraction of the time uh, they're causing something to get published that isn't true and it uh, generally undermines the, the whole credibility. Yeah, 60% is the best average number I've been able to construct by looking at a bunch of different replication studies. It does depend a lot on the subfield, though. So, for example, social priming, which is this idea that you can do something like have someone hold a warm mug and it causes them to behave more warmly, or you can prime people with words related to old people and then they'll walk more slowly. That kind of research almost entirely has failed to replicate. Like, so almost 100% of it has failed to replicate which is pretty shocking because if you think about that, like hundreds of papers were published on this by many different research teams. And it may be that there is just no phenomenon there. Like, how does it even happen? It's like <laughs> someone should do write a book about like, how do hundreds of papers get published on something that doesn't exist? Like what, what was happening? Right. It's crazy. Well, there's the other kind of priming where, you know, uh, if, if you show someone the word doctor, they will be more likely to think of the word nurse. Yeah. So, so that kind of priming, something called like word priming or semantic priming, that tends to replicate much better. So I think that a lot of that actually is real. Then you have um, other subfields, like you have like more like stuff where you're like flashing triangles on the screen and watching how people react to different shapes and stuff like that. I think that tends to have a, a pretty good replication rate. Some of the more like social results uh, maybe have a lower replication rate. So, you know, it's, like, it, it's, it's not like all the subfields are equal. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Are there any issues with science practice that are, are a big deal that you think, uh, you know, listeners to the show might not have heard so much about or might not appreciate how important they are? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think uh, one really big one that I think actually might be on the same order of magnitude as p-hacking in terms of how important it is, but is really not well known, it doesn't really have a standardized name, is something we call importance hacking. And sort of to back up to kind of like understand importance hacking, I think it's useful to think about what are all the ways to get published in a top journal? Because if every academic needs to get published in top journals to stay in the field and get tenure eventually, it's interesting to break that down. Well, what are the strategies they could use? So strategy one, they could actually conduct valuable research. And by making an interesting you know, contribution or important discovery or just adding something to scientific knowledge, they could get published in top journals. Cool. And everyone wants to do that. Of course, that's fairly desirable. The only problem with that is it's very difficult. So what are their other options? Second option, they could commit fraud. They basically can make up data, things like that. Now, I think very few people are willing to do that. It's just so unethical. It crosses so many lines. It will get you thrown out of the field if you get caught. So I think very few people do that. I think you know, probably only a few percent 
of results are like that. Okay, what else can they do? Third option, they can p-hack, where basically they get a result that's a false positive, but they make it look like it's not a false positive. And this is a lot of the stuff we were just been talking about, right? You can use fishy statistics, you can try things a lot of different ways, but only report the one that work and so on. Or just test the same thing repeatedly until one of them happens to come up positive. Exactly, exactly. And I think usually that's not done in such a like, I'm going to test the same thing 10 times exactly, but more like, oh, well, that variation didn't work. Hmm, what if I tweak this parameter? Oh, now it works. Cool. I'll publish it. Right. So it's like, you know, it, it's a little bit less cynical, but it's very common, right? I think probably something like 40% of papers have this happening. Okay. But there is a fourth method and this is what we call importance hacking. You can get your result in a top journal by tricking the reviewers into thinking that it was a valuable or interesting finding when in fact it was essentially a valueless or completely uninteresting finding. And this only works if you can trick the peer reviewers because the peer reviewers, they don't, it's not like they want to publish everything. Peer reviewers can be brutal, right? A lot of peer reviewers reject stuff. So unless you've tricked them into thinking there's value and there's not, this method won't work. Right? So it, it has to be pretty subtle. It has to be the sort of thing where if you quickly read a paper, you might not notice that this is a valueless result. And it actually kind of sounds cool if you kind of read it quickly. Yeah, I think it might really help to have a concrete example to, to explain kind of yeah, how this importance hacking uh, would work. Yeah, so there are lots of examples. And one thing that's important to note, there are different ways this is done. So we've ha- come up with different sort of categories of importance hacking of you know how essentially do you make something that's Not interesting and not cool, seem interesting. Um, (laughs) But one example that comes to mind is this paper, Testing Theories of American Politics, Elites, Interest Groups, and Average Citizens. And so the basic idea of the paper was they're trying to see what actually predicts what ends up happening in society, what policies get passed. Is it the view of the elites? Is it the view of interest groups? Or is it the view of what average citizens want? And they have a kind of shocking conclusion that really... So here are, the, here are the coefficients that they report. Preference of average citizens, how much do they matter? 0.03. Preference of economic elites, 0.76. Oh my gosh, that's like so much bigger, right? Alignment of interest groups, these are, these are like what the interest groups think, 0.56. So almost as strong as the economic elites. So it's like kind of a shocking result. It's like, oh my gosh, like society is just determined by, you know, what economic elites and interest groups thinks and not at all by average citizens, right? I remember this paper super well because it was covered like wall to wall in the media at some point. And I remember, you know, it was all over Reddit and, and Hacker News. It was a it was a bit of a sensation. Yeah. So, you know, this often happens to me when I'm reading papers. I'm like, oh, wow, that's fascinating. And then I come to like a table in Appendix 7 or whatever. I'm like, what the hell? And so, <laughs> so in this case, the particular line that, that really throws me for a loop is the R squared number. So the R, R squared measures the percentage of variance that's explained by the model. So this is a model where they're trying to predict what policies get passed using the preferences of average citizens, economic elites, and interest groups. Take it all together into one model. Drum roll, what's the R squared? (laughs) 0.07. They're able to explain 7% of the variance of what happens using this information. Okay, so they were trying to explain what policies got passed, and they had, you know, uh, opinion polls for elites, for uh, for interest groups, and for ordinary people, and they could only explain seven percent of the variation in what policies got up, <laughs> just like negligible. So my takeaway is like they failed to explain why policies get passed. That's the result. Like we have no idea why policies are getting passed, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter what uh, politicians think. Okay, I mean that's almost a more interesting result. Why didn't they go with that? Yeah, I think that's super. <laughs> interesting and okay yes fair they fa- if you had, like had to pick among the things that they did measure they did find economically and interest groups mattered more but really like they seem somehow to be missing whatever does matter in their models yeah i mean i suppose a cynic might say that there was uh, some politics behind the the line that they were choosing and i suppose by uh, highlighting the message that what ordinary people will think uh, doesn't matter, but what elites think does matter. They managed to get an enormous amount of coverage from people who are receptive to that message. But you know, of course, I'm not a I'm, I'm not a cynic, Spencer. I I wouldn't make oh, that argument. Oh, of course not. Of course, not. you know, another <laughs> thing they did. This is a kind of minor thing, but I, I feel like they juiced the uh, conclusion a little bit by calling the the economic elites. Because what, what do you think an economic elite is? What does that say to you? Oh, I guess a rich person, right? Right. So what they used for economic elite was 90th percentile. Which is like, yeah, okay, that's like, that's a bit wealthy, but it's like economic elite. I don't know. I think like, you know, billionaires and stuff like that. Right. Not 10% of the population. Yeah, exactly. 10% of the population. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any single person working full time in a professional graduate role might well make it into, at least in the middle of their career, is now an economic elite, I suppose. 
Yeah. So, so anyway, I don't mean to pick on, on them in particular, but we see a lot of things like this where it's sort of when you really read carefully, you start realizing that the result is much less interesting than it seems at first. And we, some people have asked us, well, how on earth do you notice this if peer reviewers don't? And part of it is because we've actually been doing replications. And when you do a replication, you're essentially like rebuilding a thing from scratch. Like, you know, imagine you're trying to figure out how, to how a clock works and you're just kind of examining it from the outside versus like you have to literally smash the clock to pieces and then rebuild it bit by bit. You're like, you're going to notice a lot more about how that clock is put together, right? And that's what you have to do in replications. So we just started noticing, we're like, what the heck? A lot of these results are like kind of not what they seem like on the tin. Yeah. Do you have any other uh, neat examples or maybe demonstrating some other um, you know, class of importance hacking? Yeah. So another class is sometimes you get these results that are almost circular when you like look at them carefully. So um, an example of this would be like, oh, isn't it interesting that like the big five predicts who's going to have a mental health crisis, right? That, that's the big five personality test, which is kind of the standard, uh, you know, a personality tester that has uh, academic legitimacy uh, among psychologists. Exactly. And so you can imagine interesting findings being like, oh, personality predicts who's going to have a mental health problem and all these things. But then you like look at like, okay, the neuroticism subscale of the big five just has a bunch of questions about like whether you have mental health problems. <laughs> so it's like, hmm, I don't yeah. know. And, you know, so there, there's a lot of that. So it's like you can dress things up in a way where you give something a fancy word or phrase that sounds scientific. -y. But then if you actually go look like the materials and you're like, look, well, what exactly did you ask to measure that? You're like, wait a minute. Of course that's true. Like that's obviously true based on the questions you asked. Yeah. Conscientiousness predicts whether you'll stick to tasks. Uh, <laughs> where conscientiousness is defined as your answer to the question of whether you stick with tasks. Yeah. Like some of the conscientious questions are about sticking to things. Um, or, you know, some people, I, I don't have an opinion on this, but some people have critiqued the idea of grit, which has gotten a lot of airplay saying, well, but is grit really different than conscientiousness? Because the thing is, we've known for a long time that conscientiousness predicts a lot of things above and beyond IQ. That's like a well-known finding for many years. We know that grit is highly correlated to conscientiousness. Has enough work been to prove that it's not just another measure of conscientiousness? Because if so, then you have all these new papers that are basically showing something that was already known. Now, in the defense of grit, the questions are a little different than the standard conscientiousness, but they, they do have significant overlap. So I think that's interesting like to explore like how much does grit actually differ? And if it doesn't differ, if it's just conscientiousness, then I would say it's important second. If it does differ, then it's really a novel and interesting finding, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I've I've seen this debate go back and forth. I mean, it seems like substantively, really, for like everyday life, I feel like grit may be somewhat different than conscientiousness, but it's very much in the similar spirit. And so, if we knew that conscientiousness mattered, we would have pretty good reason to suspect that uh, grit would matter as well. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know. The, the idea that it was like a really interesting research finding that deserved massive promotion always struck me as a little bit odd. Yeah, I think, you know, I think it is possible that what grit is doing is giving you a more narrow subset of conscientiousness that might be even more predictive than the broad trait. And that would be like, that would be cool if that were true. Like, oh, we can refine consciousness to this more specific thing. And that works better than just like consciousness broadly, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is there another one, you, another one you want to highlight? So that's what happens is that the thing that was actually shown is much more specific than the claim being made and in a way that's, that's not very flattering. So uh, I'll give you one example. We were looking at this paper and what they showed is that people who have a history of trauma, they explore less in a kind of explore, exploit trade-off, right? Where you can either explore new things or exploit here, meaning just do the thing that you already know works well, right? I think that's kind of cool. I think it's kind of interesting. You know, maybe not totally mind-blowing, but it seems pretty cool. But if you actually unpack, what did they actually show? Can you guess Guess what they actually show? Something about like how long they continued trying to solve a maze or I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's a good guess. It was this incredibly boring apple picking game where you had an apple tree in front of you and you either could pick another apple or go to the next tree. Those are your only <laughs> options. And they found that people with histories of trauma were more likely to like stay on the same tree. And it's like, what does that actually prove anything about real world behavior like it just seems way too specific right right yeah i mean this is a another one that i've heard many times which i think uh, was used among economists was uh, trying to you know do interventions and see whether they make people more or less violent and i mean obviously you can't have people just like just beating one another up in the in the psychology lab so uh i think the method that they used to measure violentness was seeing how much uh, kind of painful hot sauce someone would put on someone else's food when they were preparing it for them 
Um, and you can see how that's, it's kind of related, I suppose, if they suspect that the person is going to really dislike having this chili sauce. Uh, but it, you do have to wonder about the external generalizability to everyday life from this attempt to measure how violent someone is. Right. And if there were great studies showing that like administering hot sauce in these kind of experiments is linked to violent behavior in real life. You, if you could show that link, that'd be really cool. Then you could say, ah, oh, then we can use this much easier to measure proxy. But without that link being established, then it's like, well, did we really show what we wanted? And I mean, I think the fundamental thing about importance hacking is this gap between the way you're describing your results and then what you actually showed. Whereas if you like really explained it super clearly, suddenly people would be like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> That's what you showed? That's not that interesting. Um, yeah. Okay. So I suppose... Um... Importance hacking differs from p-hacking in that it's a bit less technical. Um, it's maybe you couldn't, you know, run a replication and like clearly just show that it, you know, mathematically it's, uh, you know, the result doesn't come back again the same way. Importance hack things generally will replicate. That's the, that's really the fundamental difference. If you did the same study, you'd get the same result. You just wouldn't care. <laughs> you still wouldn't care the second time. <laughs> yeah. But I suppose on the other hand, it's uh, somewhat easier because you can, you can do a test for importance hacking by really carefully reading a paper and you don't have to go and do the experiment again you can just uh, use your ordinary human intelligence to figure out whether uh, you're being hoodwinked exactly and i think if you kind of had a list of like important tag techniques in front of you and you kind of read a paper really carefully with an eye towards these techniques you would often be able to detect it especially if the materials are available and this is a really key point it can be really hard to detect important hacking with that if they didn't release the sort of original materials like if they ran a study and you don't get to see what the participants saw they could have important hacked in a way that's just not detectable in the paper. Yeah. How big a problem do you think this is compared to, you know, the the classics like publication bias and, you know, uh, p-hacking or I guess people also call it the, was it the garden of forking paths. Um, yeah. So, so like if you compare it to sort of all the things that lead to false positives, I think it's probably on the same order of magnitude. I don't know if it's as big. Maybe it's a little smaller than, than, than you know, all the reasons we get false positives as a problem. But I think it's a very substantial problem. And the weird thing is, as far as I can tell, there was no standardized name for it. That's why we call it important stack. We had to give it a name. It's not like we invented the concept. Like people have been pointing at it in different ways, but there was no sort of like, hey, there's this thing and we're going to give it a name and we're going to talk about how to solve it. And there just hasn't been a real movement around that from what I can tell. Yeah. Yeah, your, your um, introduction to this topic made me feel sorry for social scientists because it occurs to me that we actually already know a ton about people. It's just that most of these things are so obvious that you could never, pub like, not only couldn't you publish them now, you probably never could. You say, like, people really enjoy falling in love <laughs> and they're more likely to fall in love if someone's beautiful. And if they don't eat for very long, then they get hungry. And if you punch them, then they get annoyed. <laughs> it's like all of these like incredibly important things that people really need to know about other human beings. And these are like the main important effects that drive people's behavior. But it's so obvious and so evident that you could never publish a paper <laughs> on, on these things. And so poor psychologists are left trying to like find scraps of things that aren't obvious like this, <laughs> things that people kind of don't know. Uh, but of course, most things that aren't obvious, uh, are not obvious because either they're not real or the effects are kind of small and not so important. Yeah, you know, physicists have the advantage that the average person knows shit about physics. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of physics is counterintuitive. Like what turns out to be what's true is not what you like intuitively think. Yeah, Whereas yeah. social science, like mostly what's true is like exactly what you intuitively think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Funnily enough, when I had Daniel Kahneman on my podcast, I asked him, I was like, how are you so generative in your career? It's like, I'm incredible how many different things you came up with. And he's like, oh, no, mainly I just took things that everyone already knew. And I just clarified them. And so I definitely don't want to denigrate that. I mean, I think he's, he uh, tends to undersell himself. So I think he's probably underselling himself there. But, but I think there's something to that. Like a bunch of his findings, it's not that they were completely unknown before he found them, but he really clarified them. And he really showed that you could like cause them to occur in different situations and then he popularized the idea and gave us a, a terminology. So that was really, really valuable, even though maybe like people had an inkling of some of the things. So I, I don't want to say that like just because we kind of know about something intuitively, there's nothing to be done there. But I still think you're on the right track that because humans are so good at modeling other humans, it's like one of our fundamental like evolutionary drives is to like understand other people. It does make social scientists' job a lot harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I, I agree with you from reading papers. I've seen lots of 
things like this. Importance hacking seems like a really big deal. What um, is there any systematic way that we can help to reduce the temptation or capacity of researchers to to do this? Well, actually, this ties into our work with this new project we launched called Transparent Replications. Um, if you're interested, you can check it out. It's replications.clearything.org, and we're aiming to replicate new papers in top journals and try to do it quickly right after they come out. And as we started thinking about this, we came up with two original ratings that we're going to rate these papers on. We're going to rate them on transparency, like essentially, do they make their work transparent by giving us data and code and everything we need to redo the study? And then replicability, does it replicate? But the problem is this doesn't address importance hacking. And so we started thinking, well, what could we possibly do to address importance hacking? And we came up with a third rating, which we call clarity. And the basic idea of clarity is we take the claims in the paper, especially the ones in the abstract or the ones that are really like strongly made or repeatedly made in the paper, and we put them side by side with what they actually proved, like just concretely, what did they actually show with their statistics? And then we kind of say, well, how big is the gap between them? And if there's a large gap, they get a bad clarity rating. Whereas if the gap is small, like what they're claiming they showed and what they actually showed is really close together, then we give them a good clarity rating. And so this is my best approach so far of like thinking about well, how do you incentivize people not to importance hack and how do you kind of like penalize them if they're doing it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I imagine that a lot of this stuff gets through because reviewers are sent so many papers. They've got their own students. They've got their own work to do. And people aren't even paid usually or barely compensated for reviewing papers. So it's unsurprising that, you know, often they don't have time to go through things with a fine tooth comb or, de or deeply think about whether the, the paper's claims uh, add up. It's, it's, it's a way in which, you know, the whole the whole process seems a little bit broken. And, uh, and, it's, and it's not surprising that peer review isn't achieving the goals that we <laughs> that we like to imagine that it is. Right. And you, you can think of it as an adversarial game, right? Like people are trying to get it past the reviewer. If they fail to get past the reviewer, then you know it's not going to get published. So there's again that weird selection pressure to like try to find ways to get things to reviewers. And I don't mean it's in cynical. It's not like they're like I'm going to trick the reviewers. Ha ha. It's more just like I'm going to make my results sound really cool and like it probably is really cool, you know. And like you know, it's kind of like evolutionary pressure. Yeah, and I think a few things with reviewers. One is as you mentioned, they're generally not paid. Two, they're generally not spending a ton of time reviewing. I don't think the reviewers tend to be very biased in favor of like approving. Like I've seen reviewers being incredibly harsh. And I think people often complain about reviewers being unreasonably harsh or asking for unreasonable demands and unreasonable changes to a paper. So I don't think they're really biased to being overly optimistic, but I do think that they're trying to do the job quickly because they're not getting paid for it. And it's really just an, an extra thing on top of what they're doing. And they're doing it just to kind of contribute to science or they feel like they're supposed to, or, you know, there's just not that much motivation. The other thing is I don't think it's a norm for them to look at the materials, like to look at the exact study as a participant saw it. I wish that that was a norm. I wish that that was just like standard. And if you didn't send the materials, the reviewer's like, what the heck, where are your materials? But right now, a lot of people don't even publish the materials. And, and then even if they do publish them, I'm not sure that reviewers often actually look at them. And I think importance hacking is a lot easier if you're not looking at the materials. Uh, by, by materials, you mean kind of the you know photos of what the where the participants were and uh, what they saw and the pieces of paper they were given and things like that. Yeah, it, you know, it depends on the study design, but it's like I want to know what exactly happened in the study, like who saw what precisely, and like how were things worded. I mean, there's a bunch of importance hacking that can occur in just like subtle wording and things. Like you can create a positive effect that doesn't mean what you thought because it was worded in a weird way. Just just as an example. Does anyone have a selfish, like anyone in this broader research ecosystem have some selfish incentive to stand up to importance hacking? It's tough. It, Actually, I know, I know, I know who does. I, I make bloggers, uh, you know, cantankerous <laughs> bloggers who read papers and get annoyed and then gain social status by, you know, writing a takedown of some paper. So you, what, they, they, they used hot sauce. Can you bloody believe it? <laughs> yeah. So we just need a squadron of bloggers <laughs> to enforce, <laughs> enforce good norms. But yeah, I think you're right. I think bloggers do have an incentive to do it. But in the system, it's not really clear because like, one thing, imagine someone publishing a paper being like, that other paper sucks because it was just importance hacked or just, you know, it's like, that's not an interesting scientific addition. I mean, yes, it's maybe it's helpful and healthy for the ecosystem potentially, but it's not like going to get you a claim. So yeah, I don't think that, I don't think there's great incentives here. P hacking, on the other hand, at least some people have invented cool kind of technology or methods around P hacking or like studied it. And so it has led to some very interesting publishable papers. And so maybe that actually makes it easier to work on p-hacking. 
Yeah. What, what are some of the, uh, are there any like uh, techniques for tackling P hacking that, uh, that I might not have heard about? Well, one that I just think is really cool is this technique developed by uh, Simonson, Nelson and Simmons, and it's called a P curve analysis. And so the basic idea is you take a bunch of P values that a researcher has published either from one paper or from like a bunch of their papers. And think about it as you're making a histogram of all the P values they found that were less than 0.05. Right? So you're kind of looking at the distribution of how often did they get different values? How often did they get ones between 0.04 and 0.05? How often did they get ones between 0.03 and 0.04, right? And then we can think about what we should expect to see. So in a world where all of their results are false, but they don't do any sketchy methods, like it just happens that everything they study doesn't exist, we should expect a uniform distribution. Every p-value is equally likely. And that's just sort of the nature based on the definition of a p-value that if there's no effects, you expect it to be uniformly distributed, right? Flat. And for um, P-curves, they just look at the values less than 0.05. So in that case, so the histogram we're talking about here would just be uniformly distributed between 0 and 0.05. Okay, what if they lived in a world where they were doing everything cleanly, they weren't using P-hacking, but some of their effects were real? How would that change the distribution? Well, if some of the effects are real, real effects are going to tend to have low P-values, lower than chance. And so what you're going to get is you're going to get a bump on the left side of the histogram, right? Around 0.01 or 0.02, you're going to see a bulge, more results than that flat uniform distribution. So if you have a shape like that, that indicates that they're finding real effects that are not p-hacked. Mm, okay. Right. So then what if they're in a situation where they're just p-hacking the heck out of the results and mostly they're false positives that they're publishing? Well, now, you know, if you think about what p-hacking is doing is it's, getting some results, many of which are, are greater than P equals 0.05, so you can't really publish them in most journals. And then you're either doing like fishy things to get the p-value down, or you're just like throwing away the ones that happen to be just above 0.05, and then you're keeping the ones that happen to fall below it. And so what you get is a bulge, uh, like too many results on the right of the distribution, right, right around 0.05. And so that means if you have a bulge on the left, you're probably finding a bunch of real effects. If you have a bulge on the right, you're probably finding a bunch of false effects. Wow. Okay. Interesting. So people, you, like that, I guess that they'll find a particular researcher or find, I guess, some particular research topic or a whole bunch of papers on some general theme and then grab all the p-values and then see what distribution they have, whether, whether the bulge is towards zero or the bulge is towards 0.05. And then they can say, like, does this literature as a whole have this problem order or does it not? Exactly, exactly. And you could do it on all the like primary results of one researcher. You could do it on major results from a whole field. You could even do it potentially if there's one paper that had like seven studies in it, you could even, and they had a bunch of p-values per study, you could even try to do that. Um, but there are some caveats. I mean, this is far from a perfect technique, but it's like, I think a really innovative idea. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, do you know what, uh, what they've learned from this? It seems like it would be, you know, not that high effort to do this on whole lots of different subsets of papers and results and so on. Well, I think the, <laughs> the survey result is that a bunch of stuff is P really P hat. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 That's the, that's the bottom line. I, I suppose if you, uh, if, if there were people doing this on the, on the regular, then if you apply this to a, a specific researcher over the course of their entire career, uh, and then they know that they can't end up with this shape that has a bulge towards the 0 0.05 side, then that would be really, I mean, it would be chastening, I suppose, for them because it limits what they can do, over, even though you can't tell which specific papers have real results and which ones don't. Uh, it places far more constraints on what they can publish, you know, within their entire body of work. Yeah, I think if there was some kind of really strong norm where like everyone had these curves published and everyone checked each other's curves regularly, it could create an incentive like that. Although it's a very like long-term incentive. And I think what you also need, or maybe what you primarily need is like a short-term incentive of like for each additional paper, you need something pushing people to like do good work. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, speaking of p-values, uh, you did a bit of research to see um, whether the p-value that a paper had was predictive of um, how likely it was to replicate if someone tried to do the same experiment again and see whether they got the the same finding. Yeah, did you find that if the p-value was you know better, that is closer to zero, that the paper was more likely to f you know find the same result if someone repeated it? Yeah, so what we did is we looked at 325 studies that were replications of existing studies. And what's cool about that is the replication result, like they know exactly what they're testing because they're testing precisely what was in the original paper. 
And so it's very unlikely that those results are p-hacked. And so the replications tend to be a lot more reliable. And so then we can ask the question, okay, of those 325 different replications, when the original paper had a high p-value, well, how often did the replication succeed? Whereas if it had a low p-value, how often did the replication succeed? So like, I tried to look at, well, what is like the single best dichotomy? Like what p-value sort of divides the, the ones that replicated from the ones that didn't? And um, looking at this, I found that when the original study p-value was at most 0.01, so it was 0.01 or less, about 72% replicated, so that's not bad. On the other hand, when the p-value is greater than 0.01, only about 48% replicated. So it's a pretty big difference. And so um, at least from that result, empirically, it looks like a smaller p-value really does make a more reliable result. So yeah, uh, that seems to imply that we could potentially improve the reliability of published research just by requiring a lower p-value by kind of uh, shifting the tradition uh, from being, you know, it's okay to publish below 0 0.05 to make it, you know, he's got to be below 0 0.01. Uh, do you think that's a good idea? Yeah, it's interesting. I think there's trade-offs. In some ways, I like the idea. In some ways, I don't. First of all, if you actually shifted it, then there's a concern that this result that I just quoted would stop <laughs> being true because then people would game the 0 0.01, right? Of course, yeah. So we're in a world where people try to game 0 0.05. So of course, being right around 0 0.05 is a little bit suspect, right? So I think that things would get a little bit worse than they seem um, here. The other thing is that if you drop the requirement from 0.05 to 0.01, then people will have to use more money to get a bigger sample. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. There are, there are definitely advantages of having a larger sample, but it means that every study would be more expensive. And then, okay, where is that cost coming from? Do people just do less research? Well, maybe that's worth it because maybe the research is more reliable. So, but it's just, it's just worth keeping in mind there are trade-offs, right? And I, and I just ran some numbers here. You could ask the question, well, how much bigger does a sample need to be? And unfortunately, it depends on a lot of factors, but I'll just give you an example. Let's say you're looking at a correlational study. So you're just trying to test, is a correlation non-zero? If the real correlation was about 0.2, then with 100 people in your study, you can get you can achieve like P equals 0.05. But if you have to achieve P equals 0.01, you have to go from 100 people in your study to 170. Um, similarly, if the real effect was about 0.4, so instead of being 0.2, it was 0.4 correlation, then with about 25 people, you could get P equals 0.05, but you need about 40 people to get P equals 0.01. So you go from you need to go from 25 to 40 people. So in those two examples, it's about a 65% increase in the number of study participants to get the same effect at 0.01 instead of 0.05. Okay, so it would increase the cost of running these experiments quite a bit. And then, and then you'd hope you'd get somewhat more reliable findings. I mean, yeah, it seems like this would be, it would be a huge tax that you'd be paying in order to offset the kind of uh, dubious research practices that people have a strong incentive to engage in. It feels a little bit crazy that as a society or as a group of researchers, you know, everyone would accept that they have a reason to cheat. And so we have to set this like extra high threshold that's like above what we think we otherwise would have to. And, 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 and increasing the cost of research by 60 or 70%, that's, it's the best that we can do because we can't fix the underlying uh, incentive problem. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny because people are like, oh, P equals 0.05, like that's so easy to cross that threshold. But imagine you're a perfect researcher, right? Like you're really not doing anything sketchy. You're doing everything completely by the book. You're incredibly good at your job. Well, P equals 0.05 means that in cases where you're setting a false effect, so there's actually no effect there at all, only 5% of the time do you find an effect. Like that's not that often, actually. Yeah. It like already intuitively, when you think about it, that like feels like pretty stringent. And yet it's clearly gamed a lot, right? <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I suppose uh, we, we could try to do a bit of a combination of changing the incentives and raising the bar a bit. Um, speaking of changing the incentives, you've, uh, you mentioned you're trying to run this new project called uh, the Transparent Replications Project in order to, I, I guess, make it a little bit harder for people to get away with uh, publishing unreplicable research in prestigious journals. Um, yeah, do, do you want to um, explain what you're doing? Yeah, so the idea of the Transparent Replications Project is that we're doing replications of papers coming out in top journals to try to shift incentives. And this differs quite a bit from past replication projects because while I love past, I love the replication projects that have happened, they've taught us a lot. The problem is they don't change forward-looking incentives very much because they generally will go back you know, a few years and be like, let's take papers from these years and let's go replicate them. Cool, but like, why does that mean that someone now doing their research is gonna behave differently? 
And so our idea is, well, what would cause people to behave differently? Well, let's say you thought there was a much increased probability that your work will be replicated. And not only that, it will be replicated like very shortly after it's published. So that by the time people hear you about your paper at all, they also know whether it replicated or not. Like, oh shit, I better do my work differently to make sure it doesn't fail to replicate, right? Because I don't want to lose the prestige of my publication, right? Additionally, if you do replicate successfully, you could be broadcasted where we like push your paper out being like, look, this is a really great example of a paper that replicated it and it got really good results. And so we can kind of create a positive incentive too. So the idea when we were thinking about this is like, well, how do we create the biggest bang for the buck in terms of shifting incentives? And we started thinking, well, nature and science are the two most prestigious general science journals that cover lots of types of science. They don't actually publish all that much psychology and behavioral science. So we started investigating well, could we just replicate every single new psychology and behavioral science paper coming out of nature and science? Is that possible? And we realized that, okay, maybe we can't do every single one. We could probably do the majority. We probably could do more than 50% with the ones we're not doing are basically ones that are really hard to do. They're just like really expensive or complicated studies to do. And so with it, within a threshold of like difficulty slash cost, we're going to be able to do like almost all of them. And the hope is that when people are applying to those journals, they're submitting to the journals, even if they don't know if they'll be published, as they generally don't, that they're going to have to think, oh, wait a minute, if I do get published, I'm going to get replicated. Oh, man, I better make sure my result really holds up. Yeah, I guess it means that people who suspect that their results are faulty will not submit to these two journals. So it actually, it would increase the prestige of the papers that are in these journals uh, within social science or psychology. Yeah, the hope is if our project succeeds in a really big way, we would eventually cover more and more journals. In fact, what we're doing, insofar as we have extra resources, we're going to be randomly sampling from sort of three other really highly prestigious journals. And then the hope is like, if the product succeeds, we can expand the scope and cover more and more and more over time. But we think the biggest bang for the buck to start with is nature and science because they both have this really high prestige and they don't publish that much. So it's like actually plausible to do a very large proportion of it. Yeah, how is this affordable? Like even assuming that there's not that many papers, you know, keeping up with this, wouldn't it be very expensive? Where, where do you find the, the staff and the capacity to, to take this on? Well, a few things on that. Um, first of all, we're really good at running studies. We've been for years building tech to run studies, like our, our platform got a track, our platform recruiting positively. So this is like really our bread and butter. Yeah. The second thing is we we kind of tried this out because I, I didn't know if this was going to be possible. So we actually, our first three applications, we tried to keep careful track of how long it actually takes us. And this might change because maybe we got a bad sample or something, but so far on the real replication we've done on real papers, it's been about 40 hours of time per paper wow that's unbelievable <laughs> well you know <laughs> it probably I, takes like whole teams like months i would think to do this work yeah i mean uh, I, i'm impressed <laughs> yeah so th that's what we're yeah. showing so far yeah so uh, i'm hoping that we'll be able to keep that up our goal is to publish over 20 replications um the next 12 months so we'll see if we can hit that yeah is there an issue that I would have thought that many of these studies would involve a whole lot of in-person work? But um, if I recall, Positly is about recruiting online participants to do studies, or, or do, you, do you have a like place in person as well where, where people come in to do stuff? Yeah, great question. So a, a shockingly large percentage of research these days is actually done online. Okay, it's just been, it's just been growing every year. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. So a lot of these studies actually already are online. For now, we're not going to do lab studies. I would love to do them eventually. Obviously, they're more complicated. We'd have to you know make a deal with a lab and and so on. So that would be like long term ambition. But right now, we're just focusing on online. But actually, it covers a lot. It covers a really large amount. So. Yeah. So obviously, this is your bread and butter, and you've built tools to, to speed it up a lot. But presumably, it's taking much less time to replicate these papers than uh, originally went into them. And I suppose the original researchers have to conceive of the idea, they have to test out whether the method makes any sense and figure out how to how to make it work. And then maybe just like copying exactly what they did is um, just on its face, much, much, much straightforward. That is absolutely correct. It's much easier to replicate something than like in terms of time than it is to build it from scratch. Because we know exactly what we're doing going into it. We're like, ah, okay, this is precisely what we need to do. Execute, execute, execute. They don't know what, you know, they're, they're like developing the idea as they do it. So there's just a lot of like false starts and, you know, these kinds of things. Also writing the academic paper takes forever. Of right? course. It's like a really laborious process. We don't, we do write reports and they're pretty long and detailed, but still it's like, it's just, they're a lot simpler than writing an academic paper. Yeah. You don't have to get a past review or two. Yeah. Did, did you mind, uh, mind sharing who, uh, yeah, who's paying for it? Yeah, so we have um, a couple of different grants. We got one from uh, Slate Star Codex, actually, which was uh, pretty exciting. 
and that was really great. It allowed us to fund our like initial applications and kind of get the thing rolling. And actually, we just got another grant from a, just a private individual. I, don't, I haven't asked them if I could share their name, so I'm not going to do it just to err on the safety. But they were just like, yeah, I like what you're doing. This one's awesome. Like, here's some money. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Wonderful. Yeah, if people want to check out the replications that you've done so far, where, where, where can they find them? Yeah, go to replications.clearerthinking.org. And have the ones that you've done so far, did, did they pan out? Yeah, so one of them failed to replicate, and two of them did replicate successfully. So that's cool kind of in line with expectations. Interestingly enough, though, the ones that replicated didn't do awesome on the clarity ratings, which remember is sort of our importance hacking measure. So I, I recommend if you're interested in, in importance hacking, you might want to look at like, well, what's actually going on there? So it's, kind of, it's kind of fascinating sort of uh, the divergence in some cases between the, what the paper's saying and like what the statistical tests showed. Yeah, I suppose you might expect these things to be negatively correlated uh, because if you're trying to get published, then you know you can either juice the experiment itself, so make the experiment a legitimate measure of thing you care about, but then juice the results. Or alternatively, you can find a result that is real, but then uh, encourage people to misinterpret what that might mean and make it seem interesting that way. Right, and like the ideal is obviously you just do you know, really interesting research or you add something to the scientific knowledge, but that's like the hardest thing of all. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, <laughs> I couldn't do it. Um, okay, uh, let's talk now about a blog post you wrote called uh, How Do We Predict High Levels of Success? Um, what was the main point you wanted to make there? Yeah, so I think a lot of people are interested in the question, how do you be successful? And so I started thinking about what are the different theories of what makes for success? And I started kind of enumerating them, starting at really, really simple theories, going on to more complex theories. And then once I had enumerated all of them, I said, well, what do I believe is true about this? And I made them even more complex theory, as, as is my tendency to do. Um, so maybe I'll give you just a taste of some of the simple theories, and then I'll, I'll jump into my full theory of success. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, list, list a couple of them. All right. So one, the simplest theory is just that it's all luck, right? It's like everything is luck. And maybe in a certain sense, this is true because like you didn't choose your genetics. You didn't choose who your parents were. You didn't choose, you know, your early, early childhood experiences or you didn't even choose to be a conscientious person versus a disorganized person or whatever, right? So maybe on some deep level, but the problem with that theory is it's completely unuseful. <laughs> so let's move on from that. Yeah. <laughs> um, then we have theories like the Malcolm Gladwell theory where it's like, well, it's some combination of like extreme luck plus like extreme practice. So it'd be like 10,000 hours of practice. Then, you know, that's how you, you get to success, right? Okay, maybe that's slightly more useful, but also like clearly not like a very predictive theory. Then you have some more advanced theories like uh, Martin Seligman has a theory of success, which basically says it's skill times effort times self-promotion times luck. <laughs> okay. Self-promotion. I love it. <laughs> I, I might be generalizing a little bit from things he said. I don't think he put it quite that way, yeah. but that's how I interpreted his theory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, right. And, and, you know, that kind of makes sense. And I think he's on the right track and that I think it, we really should be thinking about success as a product of factors more than some of factors. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that Products, multiplying things together, have an interesting property that if you have zero in any of the variables, you get zero output. And I think that that actually holds for success in that, like, imagine, for example, skill. If you have literally zero skill, you have no ability to do anything, <laughs> like, clearly, you can have no success, right? So zero times anything is zero, right? So it kind of makes sense. Whereas if it was additive, then you could have zero skill and still be really successful because the other factors would just add on to it, right? Another piece of evidence that success is more of a product of factors than a sum is due to like a really interesting mathematical truth, which is that if you're summing together a bunch of independent variables, in most cases, that will actually produce a normal distribution in the outcome. That's called the central limit theorem. On the other hand, there's an alternative theorem for when you're multiplying factors, where instead of getting a normal distribution, you get what's called a log normal distribution, which is a much fatter tail. So in other words, you have many more like positive outliers and you don't have as much results like all compactified near the middle. And if you look at success measured by lots of different things, whether it's by money or number of publications Power. or scientific breakthroughs or whatever, it's almost, it's almost always a fat tail distribution, right, for almost all of these things. And so that also suggests that this product um, idea might be the right one, not the sum idea. Okay, so so you think the smart way to model success or the, the more sophisticated way is to think of a whole lot of different important factors um, that, that go into success and then you multiply them together. Uh, so, so you think you want to multiply together a whole bunch of factors. What factors would, would you highlight? 
Yeah, so I would want to multiply many of them, and uh, but I'll just give you a taste of some of them. And the idea here is to try to choose factors where if you have literally zero, you have absolutely none of the thing, you get a zero in output or very close to zero in output, right? And so you kind of want to choose your factors in that way carefully. And so one of them I would point to is resources slash opportunities. Like if you literally have nothing, you know, you're you're standing in the Antarctica with no clothes on <laughs> and no food, you're you're just done for, right? So you know, if you get zero on that, you're you're at a zero, right? Um, another one is intelligence. If you literally have zero intelligence, you're not able to, in any way, manipulate the environment to achieve your goals. You get a zero on everything, right? So then I guess there's uh, what what health as well and like ability to stick to tasks. Yeah, exactly. Those I would I would put all those in the model. And so I end up having you can look at my article on this. How do we predict high levels of success? You can see my full model. But then I want to add one more nuance here. After we multiply these together, I want to raise each of the factors to an exponent. So in other words, it's like factor one raised to a certain exponent times factor two raised to another exponent, factor three raised to another exponent. So this is this is putting it to the power of 0.5 or to the power of 0.2. Exactly. Exactly. And the reason I'm doing that is that because that exponent depends on what you're trying to be successful at. So having zero intelligence will make you fail at everything, presumably, um, except maybe like stopping a door open or something like that. But the importance of intelligence is going to vary a lot depending on what you're trying to do, right? Some things don't require that much. Some things require a lot. And same for any of these factors. And so for a fixed thing you're trying to be successful at, you want to think about what is the exponent on that factor? And some factors are going to drive that type of success more. You know, if you're trying to be an artist and be really successful in art, you're probably going to need different skills than if you're trying to be a salesperson or you're trying to start a new company and so on. Okay. So you'll kind of have the same list of, you know, important factors in the model, but depending on the task, you'll change their relative weighting by changing what number they are to the power of. Exactly. Um, And I guess if you put things to the power of a number that's less than one, then you get decline returns right so you know maybe it's important to be somewhat conscientious but you know being extremely conscientious uh, isn't uh, completely necessary uh, and, and so you could build that into the model exactly exactly and as that exponent gets smaller and smaller approaching zero that factor actually becomes irrelevant because anything into the zeroth power is one so the factor no longer matters right so the really extreme this factor doesn't matter but in reality the exponent will pretty much always be above zero mm. So it sounds like if you're if this is your model and you're multiplying all kinds of factors together, uh, and of course, like any one of them being zero is a is a fatal <laughs> fatal outcome. Um, then wouldn't this, would this suggest that it's really important to be an all rounder in general? Yeah, it's a really great question because it seems to be implied by the model, but it's actually not, and, and I'll explain why. So for any one of these factors, it is true that if you're too low on it, you're pretty much screwed because zero times anything is zero. But in real life, often there's a way to work around a factor. And so let's say you're a CEO at a company, but you really, really, really suck at something. Like maybe you're really bad at like convincing anyone of anything. At first glance, it seems you're totally screwed because that's part of running a company. But what if you got a co-founder who's just incredibly persuasive, right? Now, suddenly, maybe you can be the CEO who focuses on product, like Mark Zuckerberg, for example. This is what he did. He basically is just a product-focused CEO. And then he has other people. (laughs) <laughs> who are focused on the rest of the company, right? So, so there's a way to work around any given factor you're really weak in. The second thing is that while it is true you don't want to be too close to zero on any factor, there's also ways to high, achieve high values of success by leveraging your strengths. So basically, one way to model this is for any factor you're low on, you either are going to have to bump it up to a reasonable level, so like work on that weakness, or find a way to work around it. For example, having a co-founder or team member who can do it for you, or picking a a goal that just doesn't involve it very much, right? So you have to do one of those things. But at the same time, you want to look for what I call unbounded factors, factors where you can be like 10 times better than someone else or 20 times better than someone else. And usually people don't have a lot of factors like that, that they're really good at. So you want to think about what are my really extreme strengths and really lean into that. So choose a goal that really leverages the things I'm amazing at, and then try to get even more amazing at that. Right. Like you think about Tiger Woods and, you know, imagine him being like, well, I should be quite get good at baseball and soccer as well, because I'm not that good at that. I'm like, no, of course not. He like he should really leverage the things that make him truly unique. But in terms of the game of golf, if there's anything he's like particularly shitty at, he better at least spend some time working on that as well. Right. So basically what we get out of this framework is if you're weak in a thing, you have three options. Work on getting better at it. Find someone else who can do it for you, like a co-founder or 
pick a uh, goal that just like doesn't involve it very much because of the exponents really close to zero. Yeah. And then at the same time, try to find the thing you're like amazing at and just kind of like push that to the moon. Like try to get 10 times better than everyone else or 20 times better than everyone else at that thing to get a really good multiplier in the end. Yeah. So I suppose that, yeah, there are all of these folk theories uh, about, you know, what determines success, which I usually, I, I suppose, highlight, you know, one particular thing, you know, it's just, uh, you know, grit. Uh, it's about it's your ability to stick to it. It's just luck or it's just intelligence or something. And you've kind of said, oh, I want to build a more complicated mathematical model with lots of different factors and they're going to be multiplied and, there's going to, and they're going to have powers. So, so mathematically, it's very good and it can encompass uh, a lot of different conclusions. But I suppose it does leave, I mean, p- people are reaching, I think, for these simpler folk theories because they want uh to know empirically like which of these factors actually is the most important in determining success do you know of uh, any evidence that can help to kind of define these parameters in your model and help people narrow down what's most important yeah so what's really tough if if you're looking at really high levels of success it's hard to get good sample sizes right because like you know, yeah, you can kind of make a collection of like, who are some of the most successful people in history, but then you're kind of just anecdotally like investigating each of them. And you can try to make a model. It's just a tough thing to do. On the other hand, if we're thinking about more like ordinary levels of success, like being good at your job and, and, you know, marrying someone you like and so on, it's a lot easier to get data sets. So I think more is known about that kind of success. And if we think about that literature, things that come up a lot, like in the work context are... Uh, conscientiousness for a, a wide range of, of work, but not all types of work, but for many different types of jobs, you don't want to be too low in conscientiousness. Um, there could be diminishing returns. I think that's an open question. Like, do you really want to be 99.9999th percentile of conscientiousness or is that too much? I sort of suspect that at some point it actually becomes dysfunctional, but at least up until a point, it does seem like it tends to predict job performance. IQ generally uh, predicts job performance across a very wide range of jobs. So that's a helpful one. Then Spending time training at a particular skill that's relevant for that job clearly is really important, but the type of training matters tremendously. So like just number of hours someone has spent doing a thing is much less good predictor than number of hours they spent with high quality feedback. And so if you think about someone who like just plays chess every day, yes, they're going to get better at chess, but compare that to someone who plays chess every day. And at the end of the day, they break down what they did badly, what the best chess engine said they should have done instead, compare it to what they did, try to figure out why it said that. Even if they end up like you control for the amount of time they spend, the second type is going to become vastly better at chess. Yeah. And I guess social skills as well. I, I actually, uh, I'd love to know, do, do we know how much luck matters in, in outcomes? Or I, I suppose, and here we don't want to go to the, you know, the luck thing of, you know, you didn't choose to be born this way or that, but more just like, you know, a truly idiosyncratic uh, luck within someone's lifetime. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think luck <laughs> is hugely important, um, but I think it's yeah, it's hard to quantify because like, where do you stop, right? Like, it's like, were you lucky that you were the one sperm that out of the you know millions or however many sperm there are that happened to get to the egg? Uh, okay, that seems ridiculous. But like, but at what point do we like stop the luck train where we start counting as things as being your own choice, right? I, I don't know. It's like really hard to even philosophically define the right metric there. Yeah, yeah. No, as I was saying that, I was realizing that maybe, <laughs> maybe there's no answer to what I was saying, or, or I'll just have to choose an arbitrary line uh, and then try to measure. Well, the other thing is that like unmodeled variation looks like luck, right? So let's say we have a model with three factors, but really there are ten factors that are important. All the other missing factors that we're not modeling appear as luck in our model, right? They appear like random chance. So, like, how do you know what's luck in it versus what's actually skill that you just didn't model properly, or you know, a positive attribute that you didn't model properly? Okay, so the way to figure out how much is luck would be to actually have the correct uh, full model and then measure all of those inputs. Uh, and then you can see, well, what, whatever you couldn't explain uh, was luck. But I guess exactly. that's, a, that's a very heavy lift. <laughs> after, after correct, you'd also have to correct for measurement. Error. Okay, <laughs> but, yeah. I see. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, so so maybe, maybe I shouldn't expect an answer to that uh, in, in, anytime soon. But a lot of luck. Luck is, luck is huge. Right? Yeah, it's clearly. clearly huge. Okay, let's talk about something else you wrote called soldier altruists versus scout altruists. What is the soldier altruist worldview and the scout altruist uh, worldview that you kind of wanted to draw people's attention to? Right. So I think this is a useful distinction when it comes to people who are trying to improve the world. The idea is that a soldier altruist is convinced that we already know how to improve the world. All we have to do is like do it, right? They're just like, come on, we just need to do more. We need to fight more for what we already know is good. And, you know, why is it that this isn't solved already? Why are the problems of the world not solved? Well, it's because people just 
won't get their act together to act or corrupt people are blocking it or, you know, the out group is doing bad stuff that makes the world worse. So they're really focused on the, like the action piece and they think that's what's missing from altruism. On the other hand, scout altruists think that we we need to like figure out what to do. Like they think, well, the problem is we don't actually know what to do. Like most of the things you, that seem naively like the right thing to do actually don't work. They're not effective. So we need to spend way more time like thinking about how to solve the problems and then testing things out to figure out how to solve the problems. And once we figure it out, okay, then we can go into action mode. But like we're a long way from that. And I think this is a really interesting distinction. I think that effective altruists in particular tend to be more on the scout altruist side. And I think a lot of other people who are trying to help the world tend to be more on the soldier altruist side thinking we just we just got to take action. So, so if I apply this to a kind of a specific case that, that you know, I have some interest in, say, uh, you know, improving the well-being of animals in factory farming, or I suppose ending factory farming, because we think it's, uh, it's harmful to the well-being uh, of the animals. I suppose that's a case where it's quite natural, at least for a, a critic of factory farming uh, like me, to say, well, the, the problem is just that, you know, people know that they could just not eat meat. That would be a relatively straightforward thing to do. It's not rocket science. Uh, and so really what we need to do is, you know, <laughs> is, you know uh, spread the message and, you know, shame people so that they'll change their behavior. And, it, you know, in a sense, it's very obvious what needs to happen. But, but then, I, then I could say, well, I don't know how to persuade people to, to change their behavior or I don't know how to reduce the costs for them to change their behavior so that they do the thing that, that I think that they ought to do. And so from, you know, from, from the first point of view, I'm, I'm like having more of a soldier mindset. Uh, and from the, the second point of view where I'm like, well, maybe we need to do social science research to figure out how do, how do we inspire behavior change? I'm being more of a scout altruist. Do, do you think it's, it's often going to be the case that it's a bit hard to say exactly where people stand on, on any given issue? Yeah, I think that's an excellent example because it shows the value of each perspective, right? And I think in that case, both perspectives have a really good point. Like soldier astros would be like, we just need to stop eating animals and that, that will prevent them from dying in factory farms. Or we just need to like make laws that, you know, ban this. Um, whereas scout altruists would say, yeah, but like how on earth do we do that? Like a million attempts have been done to get people to stop eating meat or to change the laws, but they have failed. So, or they've only helped incrementally. So we really do need to figure out what works. And so I think, I think they both just have valid points. I think in other cases, it's much less clear what the obvious thing to do is, right? Like, let's say you want to prevent nuclear war. Like, it's not such an easy analysis. Like, you know, well, countries just need to not bomb each other. Okay, like that just seems, <laughs> that seems just sort of naive or something. Or like, all the countries just need to throw away their nuclear weapons. Well, okay, that seems to underestimate like the importance of game theory here, right? And like, I mean, I suppose some people do highlight that with war. You know, if we want to, if humanity wants to not have war, then we need to stop fighting uh, is kind of an, an old refrain. But then, of course, you can always flip it and say, well, we don't know how to do that because it would be too costly for many people to put down arms from their point of view because they'll be giving up something so important to themselves, like the independence of their country. So I suggest like, yeah, with many issues, you can put on both of these hats and, and they might each reveal some aspect of the issue. Issue. And I think that's right. And I think that's a useful thing to do is like try each hat on. Um, what I would say, though, is I think like something like war, the soldier altruist of like, oh, everyone just needs to stop fighting. It's just seen, comes across as very naive in that case, because it's like, OK, but like that's not that's not a real proposal. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> that's like a proposal like everyone should just start making the right decisions. Like, OK, yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas like something like animals, I think it's like more justifiable to be like, well, actually, we do know that we could just like ban this thing. It's not like there's nothing crazy about banning torturing animals. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess. So, so this is a reference to Julia Galef's book. Uh, what is it? Scout Scout Mindset, right? Exactly. Exactly. So I come up with these terms, soldier altruist and scout altruist, direct reference to Julia Galef's idea of the soldier mindset and the scout mindset. I highly recommend reading her book. Scout mindset about this. Um, it's not about this altruistic piece. I just sort of added that on, a sort of inspiration taken from her book. It's also related to what's the uh, what's the Scott Siskind uh, blog post about? Uh, you know, one world view. conflict theory and mistake theory. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Can, can, can you give a, a brief summary of that one? Yeah, exactly. I think you know, I think people define conflict theory and mistake theory a little differently, which can create some confusion. But I think one way to look at it is when you're considering like how to diagnose the problems of society is your diagnostic approach. One where you're like, Hmm, society is clearly making mistakes. Like let's analyze this, like a doctor who's like trying to cure a disease and like figure out how to cure the disease. Or do you have this reaction? that's more like, no, 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 that's naive. It's not like we're not in the role of a doctor trying to cure a disease. What's happening is that like certain people are oppressing other people. And there's this like conflict between groups 
And really it's like sort of more of a zero sum competition. And so like one group benefiting actually harms another group. It's not like we can just cure an organ and everyone's better off, right? So it's sort of more your emphasis on zero sum conflict, uh, you know, that, that's sort of unavoidable versus your emphasis on, no, we can like take these smart actions to make everyone better off. Yeah, I feel with that one, I, I um, just don't really come down very strongly on one side or the other. So sometimes it does seem like what's going wrong is that some people are doing something that harms others and it's reasonably clear and the, they, they should stop doing that. And other times it really does just seem like, you know, the reason that we haven't cured cancer isn't just that some people are bad. It's that, we, it's, that it's a really hard technical problem and uh, we kind of need to do a lot of, uh, you know, research and development to figure out how to, how to fix it. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. And I also think it depends on, are we in a scenario of abundance? Because the more abundance there is, the more I think there is room for cooperation. Whereas if like, imagine two tribes and there's only enough food to feed one and a half of the tribes, right? It's like, well, yeah, they're going to have to struggle to survive, right? There's going to be conflict. Whereas imagine there's enough food to feed three tribes and there's only two tribes. Well, okay. Now there's a lot of gains from they can have from trade. Like, oh, well, we've got this kind of food that you like better. Why don't we trade some of it, you know? Mm, yeah, yeah. It, it, it got to be a month or two. I, uh, this is so obvious, but it just completely blew my mind. I was, I was just contemplating the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, and the enormous suffering. You know, so many people dead in Ukraine, their economy completely in tatters, uh, you know, international relations massively damaged. It's also horrific for Russians, many of whom have died in the war and didn't want to fight in it. Terrible for Russians in general in terms of their quality of life. And it's just like they could just withdraw from Ukraine and Putin could just like stop it all. He could, he could just say, "I'm I, okay. I've decided we're not going to do this anymore. Uh, it was a mistake to invade Ukraine, or maybe even just give no reason. Uh, just say, well, we've accomplished our goals. We're we're going home.' He could just declare victory and say we won, and, and then leave. And it would just all basically. Well, I mean, obviously you couldn't undo the damage that was already done, but it would be that simple. It would be it would benefit Russia. It would benefit Ukraine. Uh, it's it's just uh, I don't know. It, it's like, I, I think that is an unusual case. It's it's quite rare to find something where almost everyone could just win if someone would just stop making a massive moral and practical mistake. But yeah, yeah, it's like the ultimate principal agent problem, where like the the person with all the power to do the thing <laughs> is just like has horrible incentives and you know a delusional outlook. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Pushing on, I guess, uh, so you obviously have these blogs on Clearer Thinking and SpencerGreenberg.com. Uh, but yeah, as I said in the intro, one of your newer projects is the Clearer Thinking podcast, which I'm a, I'm a very regular uh, listener to. So yeah, p people who enjoy this show are, are pretty likely to enjoy your show as well. Um, did you have any uh, kind of favorite conversations that you've done over, over the last few years since you started it? Yeah. So one that, uh, so I actually, I threw this question back at you and said, well, yeah. you know, what episodes stood out to you? And you yeah. mentioned this one with... Kate Hall, are we all the heroes of our own stories? And I, I really enjoyed taping that episode. I'll just give you a taste of that. Basically, Kate went through this experience where essentially she went insane. And she basically describes this process of going insane and what that was like and what she learned from it and how she came out the other side. I think it's just kind of an amazing story she tells. But I should say the format of most of my episodes is I invite someone who I think is a brilliant thinker and I have them pick four ideas that they think really matter. And then the aim is to discuss those four big ideas that they brought to the show. So that's kind of the general format. So if you think you'd enjoy that, we'd love for you to check out the Clear Thing podcast. Yeah, uh, yeah, the Kate Hall episode was stunning to me. It's, it's episode 113, if people are scrolling through your feed looking for it. Yeah, if I re recall, um, yeah, she tells a story of suffering, I guess, drug-induced uh, psychosis. And, it's, you know, I'm very familiar with mental health problems like depression and anxiety, you know, from my own experience and the experience of plenty of people I know. But I, I'd never... Uh, heard someone describe what is it like to go through um, through psychosis and how do you feel internally and then how do you recover from that? So ex yeah, extremely memorable um, story. And then I guess the, the other section about how it's incredibly hard to persuade people of a, of a narrative in which they're the bad guy <laughs> is is also a, a lesson worth uh, worth remembering. Yeah, totally. Okay, uh, let's turn now to uh, what, what I'm hoping will be a fairly uh, rapid fire round where we'll go through some of the most interesting articles and research that, that you've written over the last few years on, I guess, I guess your two main written outlets are clearerthinking.org and spencergreenberg.com. Uh, is that, that's right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I also have a newsletter called One Helpful Idea. We send out weekly with just one idea that get you thinking for the week. 
Yeah, cool. So uh, yeah, I did a scan down uh, down those blogs, and uh, there's a couple of things I, I thought it would be uh, really uh, really fun to go through with the audience. So your team at Clear Thinking recently ran a study to figure out whether your habit formation tool was actually helping people to form habits in reality, and you wrote up the results in an article titled "Does a Simple Tool Cause People to Create Habits More Reliably?" Which of course we'll link to as everything else that we mentioned here today. So forming good habits, or forming more habits, is a really general way that people might be able to uh, improve their lives and achieve their goals more. And so, you know, any any better methods here could, in principle, do a lot of good for a lot of people if they were actually applied uh, by by a large fraction of the population. And I guess it seems particularly promising because it doesn't seem like the methods that we have for habit formation are so amazing right now that we're anywhere near kind of the technological frontier, the, the best that we could uh, imagine doing. Yeah. What, so what was the setup with, with the experiment that you ran? Yeah, so this is actually for a tool on our website, clearthing.org. You can use now. It's called Daily Ritual. It will walk you through the intervention so you can see you know, what the intervention was and you can try it in your own life. But yeah, so the, the background is we wanted to figure out how to help people form new habits and we really weren't sure what would work. So our earlier pilot study was a really insane study design where we took, I think it was about 20 different habit formation techniques, a number of them drawn from the academic literature. Some of them are, were our own ideas or crowdsourced ideas. And then study participants would get randomized. So they'd get something like five techniques at random assigned to them. And then we'd actually track them over a number of weeks to see if they stuck with their habit. And then what we could do is we could say, well, for everyone who happened by random to be assigned to technique number seven, did they do better than the people who weren't assigned to technique seven? Or what about the people who got technique three? So it's a really interesting study design, because by doing a regression, you can actually look at like the causal improvement of having been assigned an extra technique and study the techniques that way. From that, five techniques came out as potentially useful. 15 of them were like kind of garbage and five were like, okay, maybe these ones work. We're not sure. This was just a preliminary study, but, but maybe these work. So then what we did is we packed those five most promising techniques into a single intervention, which is called daily ritual. And then recently we got a grant to study daily ritual as a package. So it was a kind of confirmatory study. Does this package of interventions work? And so that's what we did. We recruited uh, hundreds of people. We randomized them either to a control group or the daily ritual group. We would do, they just did the inter- intervention. It's a one-shot intervention. You just do it one time, right? So it's like very low effort, uh, very little time to do. I think it takes maybe like 15 minutes or something. And uh, then we want to see over the next eight weeks, did they stick to their habit more? And so everyone, whether in the intervention group or control group, would get a weekly survey where they tell us about how many times did they do their habit the week, how many times did they fail, um, et cetera. And at the end, they also rated how successful they felt they were with their habit overall. Are you saying that kind of all of the you know, habit formation mechanisms that you were testing out were things that uh, people just did a single time? Yes, this is a one-shot intervention. So you just do it once at the beginning. There are also reminders that people get that get sent to them. But yeah, it's a one-shot intervention. That's kind of, that's what we're aiming for. Like in 15 minutes, can we make you stick with your habit more often for like the next, you know, however many weeks? That's the goal, which is pretty ambitious. Yeah, it seems like a, it seems like a, like a heavy lift. What, what, what were some of the uh, things that you tried, the, the, the five? Yeah, so the five techniques, and these are based on our pilot study that, that showed the most promise. One is really simple. It's just listing the benefits of this habit. So after you pick a habit, we say, okay, we want you to give us the reasons why you think that this would improve your life. So, and so this is trying to create motivation. The second one we call home reminders. Again, really simple. You just write down what your habit is and you stick it somewhere where you're going to just keep seeing it over and over again. And this is just trying to overcome the barrier that people sometimes just forget about what their intention was. And so we want that to be right there. So you, it's harder to forget. The next one is one that isn't always possible for everyone, but it's called support of a friend. And basically you write a short note or letter to a friend about how they could support you in your habit formation efforts and you just send it to them. And so that could be, you know, a partner, it could be a roommate, it could just be a random friend. The fourth one is called mini habits. And this is related to the work of uh, BJ Fogg and others, where basically what you do here is you just come up with a tiny version of your habit that you'll do on days when you think you don't have enough time to do the full habit. So there's never an excuse not to do it because you're like, well, I don't have time, so I'm just going to abandon my habit. No, 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 no. Just do the short version when you don't have time so that you don't lose that sort of momentum and the kind of habit formation mechanism in your brain, right? So for example, if your goal is to do 20 push-ups a day, if that's your habit, instead, just do one push-up, right? And so you, could, you never have an excuse not to do one push-up. And the last technique is called habit reflection. I think this is the most unique one 
I don't know actually where we got this from. We might have come up with it, but I, I, I haven't been able to find it anywhere. So if anyone knows where it comes from, let me know. But habit reflection is kind of cool. What you do is you think about a previous time when you've succeeded at forming a habit. Then you write down what you did that you think helped you with that previous habit. And then you take a moment to write down how what you, you did last time that helped you could be applied to this new situation. And so it's essentially, what's cool about it is like a kind of a self-customizing intervention where like you figure out what worked for you and then you figure out how to apply what worked for you in this, in this setting. Yeah, yeah. So I think a lot of listeners to the show will be pretty skeptical of this sort of psychology and self-improvement research. Uh, and I think understandably so, because a, a lot of the research that's out there on this, uh, in, in this general vein is, uh, is pretty low quality. What, what could you quickly say to convince a listener that they should take what, uh, the results that you're about to say uh, at, at all seriously? Yeah, so I think a few things about that. First of all, I'm very skeptical of a lot of psychology research, so I'm extremely sympathetic. And as we'll get into, this is actually an area we work on, like meta science, how do you improve science? Um, the second thing I'll say is one thing that's nice about this work is it really is based on two studies. The first kind of a preliminary exploratory study and the second really confirmatory study where we had very clear goals of like, here are our main objectives. Here's exactly what we're going to measure. We're going to pit this against the control. And so I think that kind of research tends to be more reliable because you've kind of already locked down so much about the research design and you like know exactly what you're testing. Um, so I think, it, I think that it should increase reliability. The other thing I would say is something that helps me psychologically is that I have a lot of irons in the fire. Imagine that like everything I was doing is this one habit, you know, intervention. And then like, think about all the biases that would be operating on like, we have to show this works. Oh my God, imagine this doesn't work. This is our one product, our one chance. Yeah, yeah exactly. But having lots of things, irons in the fire, it's like, oh wait, if this doesn't pan out, it's not that big a deal. We can deal with it. And so it actually, I think makes us better crew seekers having more things in the fire. Yeah, uh, so you get to get to tread a bit more lightly. How did the how did the techniques work then? I, w I wasn't sure what they were going to be, but they all sound kind of uh, promising. Oh, like intuitively, I feel like they they, they might help me out. Yeah, so the, you know they're not like shocking techniques, they're not revolutionary techniques, but like the key is to get something that actually works. And and so in our confirmatory study, they did seem to work. So we increased people's weekly habits about 0.61 days per week across the eight weeks of the study period. So that's not like a massive effect size, but for, you know, a quick intervention, you do one shot deal. That seems pretty good. We also think that- It's, it's from, yeah. from what to what? Yeah, so in the intervention group, people practice their habit about 3.5 days per week and on average across the eight weeks. And then the control group was about 0.61 days below that per week. Okay. Yeah, so the, it's not a massive effect size, but uh, it was- highly statistically significant at about, I think it was about 0.01, peak was 0.01. And uh, we, there's some nice curves that we show that in fact, in every single week, the um, intervention group beat the control group. And at the end of the study, we saw the effect seemed to be fading a little bit by like week eight-ish, but still it was at least a little bit higher than the control group. And so one thing we thought about is like, maybe you could get a booster, maybe at like seven weeks, you go do the tool again, and maybe that gives you a booster shot. So that if I was going to run another study, I would want to investigate kind of a booster shot approach. Do you know what sorts of habits people were trying to, to build? Were they, I mean, it seems like people were having reasonable success. They were doing it, you know, three or four times a, a, a week on average. How, how, how difficult were the, the habits they were trying to build? Yeah, so we really wanted to make a tool that works for any daily habit. So not the kind of thing where you're going to do it once a week, but really things you could do every day or, or like, let's say at least five days a week. The most popular ones people chose were things like um, reading books every day, doing daily stretches, uh, practicing a skill every day you want to improve on, like a musical instrument or something like that, um, drinking more water every day, exercising daily. So it actually differed quite a bit, the, like, the difficulty level. Like exercising daily is clearly way harder than drinking more water every day. So yeah, but really quite a range of stuff. And because of the randomization, on average, the uh, difficulty level of the things people are practicing in the control group and intervention group should have been balanced. Hmm. Could, you, could you figure out how many people were in the study? Yeah, I think it was like a few hundred that we got final data on. Was it possible with that sample to figure out which of the five methods were better than the other? Or did you just kind of have to average average across them? You know, not for this study, because basically the intervention packed them all together. In the pilot study, we got preliminary evidence about how well each intervention worked based on that study design. But I wouldn't read too much into that because we, we tested 20 things. We took the five most promising ones. You know, there's, there's going to be a lot of regression, the mean effects. And I think it's kind of hard to tell. 
Okay, so with, with about 15 minutes of input, people were doing 0.6 more uh, of, the, of the habit per week, and it seemed like it was lasting something like two months before the effect was fading out. So I guess you, they, they did the habit four more times uh, with this 15 uh, minutes, minutes of work. So a medium, a medium return, I guess. I, I, suppose, I, I feel like my, um, my big barrier here might be that I'm, just, I'm maybe not the kind of person who would use one of the, <laughs> these, these tools typically. Uh, I'm not sure quite why I have a, a barrier to doing that. But do you think that uh, maybe even just getting people to, to have an interest in using the tool in the first place might be the, the, the biggest barrier to, to, to having an impact with these kinds of ideas? Well, fortunately, a lot of people do use our tools, but I would like to appeal to people like you. So, <laughs> it's, it's interesting to me uh, how to do that. I mean, I think there's this sort of pipeline, right? Like we have to get people to hear about one of our tools. So how do we do that? You know, we most most of our traffic historically has actually come through large media articles. Like we've been in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and uh, Life Hacker, places like that. And so that's one way people hear about it. Then once they hear about it, let's say they like look at the first page of the tool, we have to like convince them on that first page, hey, this is worth investing your time in. But we also don't want to overclaim. And so that's like a really delicate balance of like, don't overclaim, but also get people excited and motivated, right? And then we have to keep them engaged throughout the tool. Let's say for 15 minutes, you got to keep people's engagement. And you know, that can be quite difficult. There's like a million other things people could be doing. They could be on TikTok or Facebook or petting their dog or, you know, having dinner with their loved ones. So, you know, there's a lot of competition there. Yeah, yeah. I suppose, uh, although I'm not, a, I'm not a huge tool user, I, uh, I, have, I have learned some of these techniques and I think I just uh, use them organically. My partner wanted to build the habit of being more grateful. Uh, so she added to our, to our calendar uh, an event every day at 10 p.m. Uh, where we need to tell one another or message one another with three things that we're grateful for from that day. And I think we have about a 90% uh, strike rate on that. So I suppose, yeah, the, the regular reminder and the, and the commitment with, with someone else uh, has, has worked really well for us. That's great. Yeah. Well, you know, really what matters is what works for you and the different people will find different things are helpful. So yeah, if someone hears about our techniques and just implements them on their own, that's amazing. That's perfect. They don't need to use our tool. Although our tool just walks you through step by step. So it makes it like dead easy to apply this stuff. And it will also send you automated reminders and things like that. Nice. Yeah. I guess, do you do experiments on like this on lots of the tools that you're creating and then like, and, and then adjust them in one direction or the other, depending on the results? Yes, yeah, it's this really interesting balance because running a randomized control trial like this is so much work. And so, it, it, first of all, we need funding for it. So this one, we happened to get a grant, which was awesome. But in general, it's like, well, <laughs> running a randomized control trial on all 70 of our tools would be just insanely expensive and time consuming. So it's just not feasible. But we try to strike a balance. So our standard procedure for developing clear thinking modules is actually really involved. We have this like 30 point checklist of what we do to develop them. But um, after we basically have an out, you know, plan for what we want to build and an outline and we make the first version and we get a lot of internal team feedback, we then will run a study where we'll test it on 40 random Americans and have them critique it. And then after that, once we've incorporated the feedback from them, we will send it out to our beta test list. We have about 10,000 people who've agreed to be our beta testers. And send out to list. Obviously, they won't all do every tool, but you know, maybe a couple hundred or something will do the tool. They'll, then they'll leave, like, tend to leave very detailed feedback and criticism because we asked them for that. And so, in that process, we we fish out a lot of like problems with the tool, confusions, ways it's not as valuable as it could be, and also we have them rated on different dimensions, like how valuable was the experience of using this? Uh, you know, do you, would you recommend this to a friend? Things like that. And so that really helps us tell. Now that's so much cheaper and easier and faster than running a randomized control trial, but it doesn't prove the thing works. However, it does provide preliminary evidence this is useful. Like if a bunch of people do a thing and they're like, yeah, that was really valuable, that's evidence that it's valuable. Not as good evidence as actually like following up. So are these results consistent with kind of the, the broader academic literature on on habit formation? Is, is, is that literature a, a hopeful one or a, or, or a pessimistic one? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I would say one of the lessons of the behavior change literature is that behavior change is really hard. We actually created a framework called the 10 Conditions for Change specifically to try to address this because we know behavior change is so hard. We felt like we really need a framework to really think systematically about how to do behavior change. And uh, you can you access that for free. It's on our website, sparkwave.tech, called 10 Conditions for Change. But one study I think that really makes it clear how hard behavior change is, is this really huge study that was run fairly recently, where I think it was on tens of thousands of people that were gym members. They tried to get them to go to the gym more often. Yes, I saw you, uh, you tweeted about this study, right? Yeah, I, I wrote a long tweet thread about it that went kind of semi-viral. 
the original paper is called Mega Studies Improve the Impact of Applied Behavioral Science. And the basic idea is they got tons of researchers, I think it was like 30 different scientists working in small teams to develop behavior change interventions. And then they took these tens of thousands of people, it was like 60, I was 61,000 participants who already had gym memberships and used these text message interventions, 53 different interventions that the scientists developed to try to get them to go to the gym more often. And if you would read this paper, you might just kind of quickly read it normally, like I did the first time, you might actually be convinced that behavior change is not that hard because at face value, they seem to find that lots and lots of these interventions worked. But on a more careful reading of it, I realized actually that's not what the paper shows. The paper shows that actually behavior change is incredibly hard and almost none of it worked. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, let's, let, let's take it step by step. Sorry. So, so, the, so there was 60,000 or something participants in the study and they were all people who were part of this gym chain. And I guess the gym chain could monitor how often they were actually going to the gym. So you had pretty high quality data on that side. And they were, I guess, with this huge sample, they were testing out tons of different behavior change methods. Is, is that right? Exactly, exactly. So these 30 scientists that working in small teams came up with these different interventions. Many of them were just totally distinct from each other. Some were like variations on each other. And in total, I think it was about uh, 52 interventions. Okay, so, so a sample of 1,000 participants, roughly, per method that they were testing, which is uh, you know, <laughs> a very solid number. Um, what went wrong with the analysis that, that made them draw the wrong conclusion, uh, in your view? Okay, so the, the, in order to unpack that, I have to just tell you briefly about the study design, because it's kind of a funny study design. So there was this like pure control group that really didn't get anything, right? Then there was a sort of enhanced control group that got certain kind of like a package of interventions, which involved making a plan about when you wanted to go to the gym, getting reminders, and then getting paid incentives to go to the gym. You would get like points that you could redeem. I think it was on Amazon. So there's like this peer control group, there's this enhanced control group, and then all the other interventions were built on top of the enhanced control group. In other words, all these 52 interventions or however many there were got those basic intervention pieces, the planning, the incentives, the reminders, but then added something on top to see if it benefited it. Okay, so some people got nothing. Some people got kind of the basic package and then everyone else got the basic package plus one of 50 or something additional things as well. Exactly, exactly. So then when you look at how they analyze the study, like their, their primary analysis that they're kind of talking about in the abstract, they compared everything to that pure control that got nothing. And they found that lots of stuff beat the, the pure control. The paper abstract says 45% of these interventions significantly increased gym visits by 9 to 27%. Sounds really great. The problem is that the that enhanced basic package, the enhanced control, beat the pure control. And we know that all the other interventions were adding stuff on top of that. So, of course, they beat, beat the pure control, right? It's like, well, they got this package that beat the pure control. It's just like a basic feature. So, from my point of view, the much better way to analyze this is to compare the interventions against the sort of enhanced control, not against the pure control. Okay, so, so so they did find reasonably that this basic package did increase uh, gym attendance compared to the people who got nothing at all. But then they did this funny thing of comparing the people who got the basic package plus something else to the people who got nothing and then claimed that the something else was the thing that, that made the difference. Is that that's what they did? Exactly. And to be fair to the researchers, first of all, I think this is an incredible study. Like, I think they should be really commended for putting this together. I mean, think about how difficult this would be to run and how much we learn from this. So I think, A, that's awesome. B, they do mention somewhere in the paper, this analysis of comparing these interventions against the uh, enhanced control. It's just not the highlight, right? It's just like, if you just read it quickly, you wouldn't necessarily take it away. Wait a minute, this was a disaster. Almost nothing worked. You'd think, <laughs> oh, wait, 42% of things work. That's what they said in the abstract. Or 45% of uh, achieved P less than 0.05. Well, that, that seems good, right? Yeah, it's kind of, it's so strange. I mean, they must have spent an enormous amount of effort on this. And then they've kind of, I mean, from our point of view, it slightly botched the, the how, how can you defend this? How did this kind of write-up get past peer review? Seems very odd. You know, I <laughs> I can only speculate. Um, if I was a reviewer, I would have said, hey, that doesn't seem like the main finding of your paper. But it certainly sounds a lot cooler that lots and lots of stuff work. It certainly makes behavioral science look better. You know, think about the, the field of behavioral science in world A, where like they test 50 things and almost nothing works versus world B, where like 45% of it works. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I mean, at least they wrote it so that you could figure out <laughs> all of this stuff. Did they publish the, the, the data that they used for the analysis? Or That's a good question. I haven't looked into whether they published the data, but they did publish plenty of information. So that was, you know, it's a kudos to the researchers. It was easy for me to kind of get the numbers I needed once I realized that they had analyzed in this way. So that's awesome. And then I looked at, well, what actually did work? Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's kind of funny. So basically, there were four things that had evidence of working. <laughs> and I should say, even the evidence of them working isn't that strong because we're just talking about P less than 0.05 after testing 52 interventions. So you'd expect there to be some false positive, right? So you expect maybe like one to three false positives here. So four things working, that's not, <laughs> it's not that exciting. <laughs> um, right. Well, you'd expect two or three false positives assuming that none of them worked at all and the experiment had been done perfectly with no bias towards finding positive results and, and, and plausibly things that won't be quite at, at that level of, of perfection. But, but nonetheless, um, you know, what were the, the, the few that worked? Well, I suppose firstly that the basic package that most almost everyone got, that worked, right? Um, remind us what that was. Yeah, that seemed to work. And that was a combination of planning when you're at the gym incentive. So every time you went to the gym, you got points so you can convert to Amazon gift cards. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was something. And then reminders. So you, you'd be reminded of your intentions. Okay, great. So yeah, it makes intuitive sense that that would work. And what were the, what were the additional um, four extra things for which we have like some reasonable effort that they might have helped as well? Right. So there's two that kind of suck and there are two that are cool. So <laughs> I'll start with the ones that, I'll start with the ones that suck. Okay. The first one uh, that I think kind of sucks is giving people bigger incentives. So it turns out if you pay people more money to do a thing, they do it more often. I think that probably is true. And I think it's not very interesting. Okay. Well, I mean, hmm. I, I, I would say that that sucks. It's kind of, it's kind of useful to know that, uh, I, mean, I mean, and it leads into potentially, you know, some people use these commitment contract things where they give someone else money and they only give it back if they, you know, meet their goals or they manage to stick with their habits. So maybe, maybe it endorses that kind of thing that people do care about uh, monetary rewards. Uh, I guess it also helps to explain why people bother to show up to their, to their jobs at all, <laughs> why, they, uh, why they show up to jobs even when, they, even when they don't enjoy them. The longstanding mystery of why people go to work. <laughs> <laughs> Cut, cutting edge behavioral science. But yeah, okay. So what, what, what were the other three though? Right. So another one, I say this sucks just because I'm skeptical of it. They gave people information about what's normal, telling participants that a majority of Americans exercise frequently and that the rate is increasing. Is that true? Well, <laughs> I, I, I don't know whether it's true. I don't know if it's true. It's a good question. Yeah. I hope it's true. Um, mm. Or at least that they debrief people if it's not true at the end. But what makes me so skeptical of it, like intuitively, it seems like it could work. Like we know social norms can be powerful. There have been previous studies showing that giving people social norms can create desirable behavior. But what makes me kind of skeptical of it, uh, the, and I believe it was Jacob Falkovich who pointed this out. I didn't realize this at first when I posted about it. In that huge list of like 52 interventions, there was other ones that were very similar to this that totally failed. And so because of that, it's like maybe probably a false positive, I would say. I see. So, so there were several interventions that were very similar along you know, with the same kind of underlying theory. And then one out of a few of them came up positive, but probably if he averaged across all of them, the effect would be not significant and maybe, maybe closer to zero. Yeah. So if you have these different pieces, that are like kind of the components of the intervention, those don't work, but the intervention to combining them works. It's kind of, you know, a little bit, yeah. a little bit questionable. Ra raises an eyebrow. Okay. Uh, what were the, what were the two ones that are, that, that are more promising? So here are the ones I thought were, were more promising, more interesting. One is giving people bonuses after they mess up. So the basic idea is if you fail to go to the gym when you, when you wanted to, you'll be told you're going to get a special bonus if you recover from this mistake. So the next day, if you go at the time you planned, you'll get extra points. And I think this one probably is not a false positive because actually in the top five, this occurred twice. There were two slight variations on it and they both were in the top five. So that seems really promising to me. Mm. Okay. How can people apply that in their normal life? I suppose it's, you have this issue of like falling off the wagon that a lot of people have when they're trying to change the habits. And I suppose you need to have an extra reward for yourself if you miss a day and then you manage to get back on the the next day. That, 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 that's maybe like an intervention point where you're particularly able to, to, to make a difference by geeing yourself up. Right. And I think the key is to think about a failure as not, okay, I'm, now I'm screwed up and now it's not even worth it. It's like, no, 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 wait, now I can recover and I should be like, feel really happy if I like am able to recover. Because think about doing a habit, you're going to have failure days, like inevitably. 
if you can't recover, then you're pretty screwed. So I, I just think that that's just a reminder that the recovery piece is as important as the, you know, doing the habit in the first place. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. An app that I use called Habitica, which is kind of, it's this attempt to make like a, uh, a role-playing game out of following your daily uh, good, good habits. Uh, it, it has this phenomenon where if you add something to your to-do list uh, and then you, and then you kind of fail to hit the deadline, then the reward for doing it the following day goes up a little. And I, guess, I suppose it's based on, 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 on this kind of idea that you really don't want people to despair because they've uh, failed to achieve their goals. If anything, you want to reward them even more because now there's like maybe a barrier to, to getting started. It's always fun to see cases where a product and academia kind of converge on a similar solution and not necessarily even talking to each other. Okay. And what's the, what's the other promising one? So the other one is really quite interesting. They gave people a choice of a gain frame and a loss frame for the points they earned. So the idea is when you go to the gym successfully, the time you planned, you earn points, right? So that's a gain frame. But you can equivalently think of it as you start with all the points. And every time you don't go to the gym, you lose points. And this intervention, they actually let people choose. They said, do you want to have this many points at the beginning? And every time you don't go, you lose them. Or do you want to have zero points at the beginning? Every time you go, you get them. And of course, it's the same number of points either way. But by letting people choose, they found people actually seem to go to the gym more often. And we don't know for sure it's not a false positive, but I think it's kind of cute. And if it actually works, that's pretty cool. Yeah, maybe I guess it suggests that people might know themselves and they might understand, uh, yeah, which which one of those is is more motivating for them, kind of the the whip or the carrot. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of choose your whip or your carrot, and you know maybe people are better than chance at choosing it. So okay, cool. Yeah, is there anything anything to wrap up on the on, on habit formation before we move on? Well, there was another really fascinating aspect of this experiment, which in a way is really depressing. But um, so they had a bunch of groups try to predict which techniques would work well. They had ordinary people do it. They had professors do it who were in relevant fields. And then they had practitioners do it. And can you guess the results? Uh, I would guess that, that nobody was able to predict, probably. Yeah, it was pretty garbage. All the predictions <laughs> were pretty garbage. The ordinary people actually outperformed. The professors and practitioners were <laughs> hilarious. But I think that's probably just a fluke chance. It wasn't like a super strong effect. So I think probably the answer here is just like it's really hard to know what will work for behavior change. And I think this is because there are a lot of barriers to behaviors occurring. And this is what we try to do in our 10 conditions for change framework. We try to map out well, what are all really all the barriers. And then what you start to realize is in a different behavior change context for a different person, you could have really different barriers. And so like, it's hard to have like a one size fits all technique. I think very often you have to do things like stack techniques. Like for example, that enhanced control, it's stack three techniques or in our habit formation tool daily ritual, we stack five techniques. Why? Well, because one technique might for work for one person, another for another. And so like, if they're short and easy to do, maybe just put them together. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, let's turn to a new theme, which is um, decision making. And yeah, a big theme of your website, Clear Thinking, is basically helping people improve their lives, which uh, includes uh, making making better calls about uh, difficult things they have to potentially change or ways different ways their life could go. So the, the, the audience here is likely to be pretty familiar with some of the common, you know, classic mistakes that people can make when making decisions, um, at least at least if you, if you believe the psychology literature. Um, I think one that I was really reminded of recently was how people tend to buy much less food at the supermarket when they're not hungry at, at that moment. Because I noticed that I was at the supermarket and didn't feel like buying anything for that week just because <laughs> I just eaten and I had to, had to overrule that. Um but yeah, some, something you've written on, on decision making that I uh, really loved because, frankly, it's exactly what I think about the topic, uh, is the FIRE framework for figuring out when you should use intuitive thinking versus deliberative thinking. Yeah, there's four situations that you highlighted when uh, you think that it's good to go with your gut. What, what's the first one? Yeah, so the FIRE framework is all about like, yeah, when should you go with your gut? And basically what I claim is that in these four cases – Usually you should just go with your gut. It's not worth like going into deep reflection. So the first case is for fast decisions. So the F in fire stands for fast. So imagine that you're driving down the highway and suddenly a car going the wrong way in your lane like is like careening towards you, right? You don't have time for reflection. You just, you got to decide. You're going to the left, you're going to the right. What are you doing? And just act, right? So the fast decision, you got to go with your gut. Makes, it, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, what's, what's the second? So second is the I in FIRE it stands for irrelevant decisions. This is just very low stakes decisions that really don't matter where, you know, using your reflection is probably just not worth the investment of your, you know, conscious mind, just spending your time thinking about something more important. So this would be like, you're at the salad place, you're trying to decide, do I get carrots in my salad? It's like, does it really matter? Just like, if your gut tells you, you get carrots, get carrots. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, I mean, that's a case where it's really easy to tell that it's... um 
that it's a trivial decision uh, or not a very consequential decision. But uh, it, it is, it is, I think, common to sometimes get stuck thinking about something that doesn't uh, matter all that much. And sometimes you have to mechanically go through and think, well, you know, what's the best outcome that I could plausibly hope for here? And then what's the worst outcome here? And then compare them and then realize that the stakes is, you know, $10. I often find myself, you know, I mean, with, with money, often you can just get, get quite disconnected from how much money is actually at stake in a, in a decision in, in aggregate. Uh, at least that's, that's my experience. My uh, my favorite example of this is that uh, I was with my lawyer friend who was making, I don't know, $400 an hour or something ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she got a gift certificate for her birthday. And we were at a bookstore. This is like, you know, five years ago or something. And she spent like two hours deciding what to buy with this like $30 gift certificate. I was like, <laughs> do you realize how much of a waste of money this is? Spending that long on a $30 gift certificate for someone that makes as much money as you? And it, and it was like, if it had been fun, if she'd been like browsing and enjoying herself, that'd be one thing. But she was like stressed out over this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you really do have to have to stop and analyze. You have a calculator on your website that helps people figure out like what is their rough value of time. So I have a sense of... Of, you know, should I spend a half an hour to save $10 or not? And, it, and obviously, that's going to vary a lot between individuals, but it's worth having some sense of <laughs> how much time it's sensible to spend uh, for any particular amount of monetary stakes. Okay, what's the, what's the R? Yeah, so the R stands for repetitious decisions. So think about someone who's a chess master, who's played you know, thousands of games of chess with feedback on how they did. That person is going to develop an incredible intuition for what is a good chess move. It doesn't mean that they can't spend the time thinking about it, but it means that they don't necessarily have to. And so you, um, there's this amazing example of Magnus Carlsen playing chess against three people who are like pretty good. They're not like, you know, top, top people in the world, but three people are pretty good. And he, he only gets a few seconds per move. So he like really doesn't even have time to reflect. And he beats them all. But the craziest part is he's blindfolded. So he has to keep all three boards in his mind simultaneously and make each move within a few seconds. Like think about how ridiculous that is. So... At some point, you've done something enough that you your intuition is just built up. And I think really the key here is intuition is not magic. Like sometimes people treat intuition as magic. Like, yeah, your, your gut knows all these things. No, your intuition has to learn, right? So if you're in an environment where you've done a, a type of decision many times and really key thing, you've gotten feedback. So your intuition was able to update then you can often trust your gut. On the other hand, if you've never done a type of decision before, like if Magnus Carlsen suddenly plays a new game that has nothing to do with chess, like he might really suck, right? In fact, his intuitions might be actively harmful in, in a new game that's completely unrelated. Or if you've done something before, but you never got to get the feedback, so your intuition couldn't like learn, the, the learning algorithm in your brain couldn't update, your intuition may not be reliable. Like imagine, you know, every day shooting archery, but you're blindfolded and you never get to see if you hit the target. It doesn't matter how many times you shoot the target, you can't find out if you hit it or not. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. What's the, what's the E? So the E is for evolutionary decisions. And so this is, there are certain things that are hard coded in animals and people being animals, you know, they're hard coded in us and they're, they're not always right, but they're pretty good heuristics. Like if you are looking at a piece of food and it smells horrible, like just don't eat it. It's just not worth it. It might, it might make you really sick, right? If you hear a really loud noise suddenly, unexpectedly, yeah, like probably you should try to get away because, you know, maybe it's just like a balloon popping, but maybe it's like an explosion or an earthquake or whatever, right? So it's like, well, okay, maybe you can't run from an earthquake. But, but anyway, <laughs> the, the point is there's a reason why we're scared of really loud sudden noises because they often indicate danger. So there are certain kinds of evolutionary intuitions we have that are they're pretty reliable and generally you should err on the side of following them. Yeah, I guess a, a tricky case here is um, reading other people, where it's something that humans definitely have evolved to do to understand the people around them. But uh, it's also possible to read people completely wrong sometimes, uh, despite that. Uh, do you have any thoughts on it? Yeah, so I think this is part evolutionary and part repetitious. So every once in a while, you may just be like walking down the street and you just see someone and they just give you a really bad vibe instantly. And I think that's sort of a evolutionary thing that can happen where like, let's say someone, their face just looks really angry or something like this, right? I do think we have a general like, oh, that person looks really mad. Hmm, maybe I should stay away. Or they just seemed like totally like not there, right? They seem like maybe they're on, you know, like very serious drugs or something. Yeah, okay, probably better to avoid them just in case. And there, I would put that in the evolutionary bucket, just like air on the side of safety. You know, if there's a low cost of avoiding them, why not avoid them? Then there's the repetitious piece. And this is like throughout our lives, we get lots and lots of feedback interacting with people. And there, I just think you have to kind of know how good are your intuitions, right? Are you more the sort of person that's like, oh yeah, you know, I interact with people and I get a bad vibe, but I like push past it. And then later I find out 
like they're actually not a good person and they hurt me? Or are you more the sort of person that's just like, you know what, I'm like just nervous all the time and I get nervous at everybody and like my signal, you know, my signal of nervousness around someone just like doesn't mean anything. And there, I think you just have to use your past experience and understand like, did you get the proper feedback to be good at predicting that thing? Or are you more someone who just is like, doesn't have reliable indicators? Yeah, it's an interesting question why it is that our intuitions about people are ever really wrong, um, given that they, you know, they often are quite wrong. And I suppose, well, one, one thing is just there's massive distribution in skill at reading and understanding other people. So some people are exceptional and some people, as, w- as with any difficult task, some, some people aren't very good at it. But there's also just, um, there's a big adversarial element to a lot of social situations where people are very often trying to obscure uh, their, their true feelings about you or, or what you're saying. And so it's possible to get like uh, incorrect feedback all the time about what people are actually thinking or or how they're reacting to you, um, or I mean, because people <laughs> don't don't necessarily want to wear their heart on their sleeve, and that can be a big problem if you haven't learned to uh, <laughs> to see through it. Yeah, I think all of that's true. I would also just add that often we don't have much information, right? Like someone walks up to you in the street and says, "Excuse me," like you're you really have very little information to make a judgment of like. Is this person just asking for directions? Is this person going to assault me? Is this, you know, and so of course it's going to be error prone because you don't have much to go on. And, but I also agree, like some people could be much better at picking up on things, some much worse. In New York, you know, when someone approaches you, you probably (laughs) tend to err on the side of, hmm, why is this person talking to me? Whereas, you know, maybe in a small town, that's like totally normal. And you're just like, hello, how are you doing today? You know? Yeah. Okay, let's now go through a short and sharp blog post that you wrote uh, titled How Ideology Eats Itself or a quick primer on how to be a genuinely good person who harms the world. I'll explain in a minute why I see it as a, as a, as a decision-making uh, issue primarily. Uh, what was your main message with that one? Yeah, so here I was thinking about this pattern I've seen where ideologies that like are really well-intentioned can go off the rails. And I was starting to think about like what's, the, what's going on here? Like why does there seem to be this trajectory of like, them starting as this really positive force and then maybe ending as like a more negative force. And so I started realizing there's just a sort of somewhat predictable series of things that happens that takes the ideology in a bad place. And so I'll just like kind of signpost like a sort of series of steps that I think is pretty common. Yeah. So first of all, like the ideology has like some good ideas, some ideas that are really appealing to people that like draw people into it, like they're attracted to it, right? And once that happens, like once people start joining the group, as with any group, there's now incentives to show group membership, right? To signal that you're a member of the group. And that makes people in the group like you more and trust you more and, you know, shows you're, you know, a good member and so on. So that naturally makes an incentive to essentially ignore doubts that you might have, right? It's like, imagine that you're a Christian that's like constantly doubting and making people aware of those doubts versus a Christian that's just like, yes, I totally believe. Like, it's going to be a lot easier to fit in in a Christian group in the latter situation. So I think that there can be a pretty strong incentive to not talk about doubts, but also even internally to try to suppress your own doubts because they can kind of like reduce your own sense of group cohesion and you're fitting in. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I think, I think, I think we've all seen, uh, seen an effect like that play out. Well, yeah, what, what, what happens next? Right. So, okay. So now we have people trying to fit in. They're, doubt- they're, they're suppressing their own doubts. The next phase is that this in-groupiness tends to create like outgroups, right? And so if like, if you're the good guys, like every group believes they're the good guys, right? Then the people that oppose your group, they're the bad guys, right? And so then you start to get this pressure towards seeing the outsiders as bad. And, you know, this happens in cults where like cults generally have like a positive mission initially, like we're going to help the world. We're going to, often it's like, we're going to save the world, right? But then there's this also, like, they start viewing the world as, like, outsiders who are bad. Like, we're the good people. They're the bad people, right? Or you also see this over much larger scale communities where it's like, oh, we're the good guys. The capitalists are the bad guys. Or we're the good guys. The communists are the bad guys or whatever, right? And so you get you start getting this, like, us versus them, good versus bad mentality, right? So, you, so okay, so now we have two pieces in place. Suppression of doubt and, like, in-group versus out-group. Out-group's bad. We're the good guys, right? Yeah. Yeah, go on. Okay. So now we get into this third phase where, and this is where I get like really weird stuff starts to happen where, okay, we're the good guys. So we have the good beliefs, but the problem is if some of the good beliefs turn out to be false. And I think that this is like pretty likely to happen, right? Because like, you know, you want to kind of double down on what you believe. Like if you're a communist to fit in really well, you almost like want to have an exaggerated belief about how good communism is. And you don't want to like notice all the ways that communism doesn't track the world very well. Or if you're like, 
you know, hang out with all like capitalist libertarians, you have a lot of incentives to sort of double down on like capitalism is good for everything. It's like never bad, right? Um, and not really track cases where it's just like a disaster, right? And so what starts to happen if some true beliefs end up in the bad guy category, right? Like, oh, wait, the bad guys believe that true thing, right? And the us good guys believe the false thing. Of course, you don't know that. Like, that's not what it feels like on the inside. But if that actually happens, now you get this extremely strange incentive to not look at the world too closely. So suddenly you have a group that's convinced they're the good guys. They've got some false beliefs and they're actively refusing to like look at the way the world really is. And I think this is where groups can get really scary and do really horrible things, even though everyone is well-intentioned, they're really trying to do good, they set out to do good, and yet they like severely damage the world. And I would suggest that like a bunch of groups in history have like gone through a series of steps similar to this. Yeah, yeah. I suppose on the last one, something that might be a little bit more recognizable is just that you you know on some level that you know a belief x that's really important to your group might not be 100 percent right or, and you worry that if you look into it too much then you might realize you might start to have doubts about it or have a more complicated nuanced view about the issue that other people won't appreciate and you're just like maybe i won't look into that maybe i'll just kind of say the thing that helps me to get along with people and not think about this issue too deeply uh, i think that's a pretty relatable <laughs> pretty relatable action Exactly. And I think there's actually, in addition to this, like leading groups to do a great deal of harm, I think there's an internal harm this can cause psychologically, where people are like strongly incentivized to not look at reality. And there's this like double think that people start to engage in of like, you just like all the evidence around that thing being true is like suppressed internally, and you're not allowed to like think about it and you feel guilty and bad. And, you know, and I think you can see this in some religious communities where people where doubters like feel extreme negative psychological effects from the doubt. And then they're like trying to pretend that they're not doubting. You can see this in ideological groups, you know, like activist groups where like an activist starts realizing, oh, maybe, maybe we're actually causing harm, but no, 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 we can't be causing harm. You know, it's just like, yeah, yeah. So it's, it can be very intense. So, I mean, I think that probably like basically all human groups go somewhere along this spectrum. The early stage, I think a very um, frequently studied finding or a, a, some, a, a regularity in human behavior is that if you take a bunch of people who agree on something, you know, who agree about some topic where, you know, many other people disagree and you get them to just sit in a group and talk about that topic for a while, they come away with a substantially more extreme view on that topic where they, they think that they were even more right now than, the, than they were coming in. And so if, if you ever just get a group of people who have, you know, any particular idiosyncratic opinion uh, and they just and they start socializing together, as people generally do, because they like to hang out with people who share their interests and share their views, then you're at least going to get this initial effect of, you know, uh, pushing your views out to be more confident uh, about the, the things uh, that you have in, in common with the people around you. And then, you know, some groups continue along this track towards the second and kind of third stages. Yeah, it also, what you just said reminds me of, an idea, I think LAs or Yukowski had this idea of evaporative cooling, where basically you can get this funny effect where like you've got this intense group. The people who are like the most believers can end up driving out the people that are kind of on the fence. But then if you think about what that does to the group, like the average intensity then goes up and it kind of keeps ratcheting up as like the least intense people get driven out. Yeah. So that's another way that, yeah, a group can, can become more extreme in its average uh, average opinion over time. And I guess it's a somewhat positive feedback loop there, where as, as the group like diverts away from the mainstream, then the people who are closest to the mainstream might preferentially leave. I mean, of course, the positive feedback loop can't be that extreme. Otherwise, we would see this phenomenon being even more powerful than it, than it actually is. Right. And you see, clearly, you also sometimes see the sort of opposite effect of like, for fan clubs and things like this, it's like, originally, fan clubs are just like, the weirdos who discovered this niche band and they're just showing to every show and like, why are they so obsessed with it? And then the band becomes popular. And now the fan club is people who are like, yeah, I occasionally listen to them. I love them, you know? And it's like, <laughs> and then the original fans are like, fuck you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're the real fans. So that's yeah. sort of like the opposite where it becomes like, so it either gets like more extreme intensified or it like becomes mainstream and watered down and now it's just like boring, right? Yeah. Of course, I mean, and, and there's other ways that, uh, other things that temper this phenomenon, like just, you know, reality intervenes and people actually observe the world and then uh, that causes them to moderate their extreme views or they want to fit in, you know, with their family. And so, so I think this is a very general phenomenon that you're describing that, uh, you know, ranges from like moderately powerful to extremely powerful, depending on the social dynamics of a group. But yeah, the reason I see this as like an interesting decision making problem is that 
if you're ever trying to, you know, do something significant, um, be an activist on some topic, uh, you know, start a startup, kind of uh, whatever, something that's beyond an individual, then you almost certainly need to find other people who share your goal and share your interests and share your passion about some topic in order to collaborate with them, because just most important stuff is beyond one person, and you'll be able to accomplish more as a group. But then as soon as you have a group of people who have been selected to have some common goal, then all of these phenomena can potentially start to kick in and potentially cloud your judgment or at least cause you to have, you know, uh, to double down on the goal and the beliefs of the group uh, where originally you might have been more wary to do so. So avoiding this is not trivial. <laughs> In order to avoid this, you could just uh, make sure that you don't hang out with people who share your opinions. But then how do you get stuff done in the world? Uh, it seems like actually there, it's, it's not, not so simple to navigate. And maybe to some extent, you need to tolerate this phenomenon in moderation and mostly be wary of you know, the, the further stages where it gets really toxic and hard to escape from. Yeah. And I think a, a simple rule of thumb, it's not always easy to follow, is make sure to hang out with some normies too. <laughs> like whatever weird group you're in, if you're at the point where you're only hanging out with your weird group, that's probably quite unhealthy. And like, just like more typical people actually can really ground you when you're like, well, of course, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, what? <laughs> Dude, you're getting weird. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, can, I completely agree with that. Uh, there's a whole lot of benefits to not, not just hanging out with one social group and not just hanging out with people who have um, a particular set of views. It also seems like the thing where you start demonizing and criticizing people who don't share your peculiar opinions, that, that seems to me where you're starting to get to the dangerous stages to a greater extent. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if you have an in-group, but the in-group is kind of like, yeah, you know, other people are fine. There are lots of other good groups, blah, 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 that we don't really have an out-group. There's nobody like we're demonizing. I think that's like tends to be a healthier equilibrium. Whereas if it's like, they're the bad guys ruining everything and we're the good guys on a crusade. We, part of why that gets scary is because if they really are the bad guys, you're justified in doing, well, you might believe that you're justified in doing bad things to them. And that's like where it can really get off the rails. Like, well, we're the good guys. So it's okay if we do some like kind of sketchy stuff because we're good and they're bad, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. I suppose, you, you know, you could self-consciously go go in for this where you say, well, you know, we wanted to start, a, you know, we wanted to start a company with, you know, goal X and using method Y. And so we came together because all of us are like much more positive, much more optimistic about this than anyone else. And that has, you know, that's helped us with team cohesion. It causes us to, you know, be able to work harder because we all are perhaps a little bit deluded in favor of, of, of this project. And, you know, as we spend more time together, probably we might even become even more deluded in, in favor of our goal. But we're willing to accept that. And, you know, on some higher level, I appreciate that we might well just be wrong. <laughs> I'm happy to say that we might be wrong. And uh, at some point, we might have to abandon the whole thing. But for now, uh, we're going to enjoy inhabiting this kind of group dynamic that keeps us motivated and makes us good friends and helps us do something difficult. That seems like a plausible middle ground to me. Yeah. And, you know, for really difficult things, especially early on when they're like very likely to fail, it's really important to have people around you that like are fighting with you and believe in you. And, you know, it's like you think about startups, why, you know, why is it that startups can feel really culty? Well, it's like, they're trying to do this crazy thing and they have to really believe in it. And if they didn't believe it, they would have just given up by now because it's so hard, right? Yeah, exactly. There, there were lots of less culty saving startups and they all disappeared because <laughs> the people quit. Right. So there's a, you know, there's a bit of selection pressure towards like a group that is unified and like fighting for the same crazy thing and has this, you know, a bit of a weird belief about something. Yeah, sports teams are a good example of this where, you know, people get really into their, their groupy mindset, but then usually they're also able to walk away from it and they don't actually think that people who support, you know, other, other sports teams are, are bad. It's more indulging this as, I guess, you know, a guilty pleasure almost. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting to think about sports as simulated war. Because like we as, you know, more civilized, you know, humans think like, oh, it's bad to club people to death. Like we shouldn't do that. But if you club them to knock them down to steal the ball, okay, that's acceptable. <laughs> and if you like, yes, we don't really hate the people on the other side, but we can like pretend to hate them. We can like play hate them, right? We can like, you know, if we meet one of them, we can be like, you're awful, you know, blah, 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 right? But like everyone kind of knows it's a game because we have this very warlike internal mechanism in our brain. And we like want to indulge it. I mean, I don't because I don't like watching sports, but most people, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I actually do mixed martial arts for fun. So, uh, you know, I can, I can get, I can understand the warlike side, you but dabble. like, you know, we have this thing and it does, it does feel good as a human to explore it. Totally. 
Okay, yeah, on, on the decision-making theme, you have this other really nice talk called uh, Make Decisions Like You Climb Mountains, where you note various common pitfalls that people run into when they're trying to make big decisions or, or planning out their life. Uh, and yeah, unfortunately, we, we don't, we, we've run out of time to, to do that one today, but we'll stick up a link to that for people who would, who would like to check it out. If only your podcast episodes were longer, Rob, then we could fit in more. It's a common complaint. People are just like, yeah, why, why so short? Why so short? Let's move on to an approach to life, which you've recently started outlining on your blog, uh, which you've dubbed valueism. Uh, and I honestly can't believe that valueism wasn't already taken by some other idea. <laughs> Spencer, like how have philosophers, uh, how have scientists not, <laughs> not grabbed this, this term before? It's, a, it's an excellent piece of branding. Well, you know, first of all, I'll give uh, credit to Cat Woods, who gave me the idea of calling it valueism. So thank you, Cat. Uh, second of all, I think there are a couple things out there called valueism, but they're not well known. They're not popular. So I actually purposely avoided like reading about them because I didn't want to like accidentally like reproduce them. I want to just really be like, okay, I know there's like something, but I have no idea really what they are. So let me just go do my own thing. And I think having done that, what I'm calling valueism is quite different from these other things. And they're quite obscure. So like, I don't think there's too much danger of them being confused so yeah okay well obviously we'll stick up a link to to your blog post for people who'd like to read the full series but yeah first uh, what is valueism in a nutshell yeah so valueism is my life philosophy and i'm proposing that you consider it as life philosophy and basically in a nutshell it just says figure out the things you intrinsically value and then try to use really effective methods to create more of what you intrinsically value and that's it. But, it, you know, so it's like sounds incredibly obvious and simple, but I would argue a few things. One, I would argue this is very, how very few people live. So I'd argue this, it might seem common, but it's actually not. Second, I think there's a lot of nuance and like, well, what are we talking about exactly? <laughs> like, what do we mean? Like figure out your intrinsic values. And third, I think there's some nice advantages to living this way. So, yeah. Yeah. What is valueism defined in contrast to? What are some examples of people who aren't following valueism? Right. So, I think the most common thing that people do is they just kind of like, they do some combination of like following reasonable heuristics, like being influenced by like their culture and their parents and their friends and social circles, right? Setting goals that like sound nice to them and then trying to achieve them and like using their intuition as a guide. And so I think that's like a lot of how people live. Like, I don't, I don't mean like everyone. Then there are people that are like, try to be more principled, like have a, a, like a philosophy. But I don't think most people have a philosophy, but like some people have a philosophy. And okay, let's talk about some popular philosophies. One is effective altruism is, you know, kind of a relevant, relevant philosophy. And so some people try to use that to guide them. And many, but not all effective altruists are utilitarian. So that's even more specific philosophy telling you how to live. Um, so that's an alternative. And then, of course, there are a lot of different religious philosophies that tell you how to live. You know, Christianity tells you how to live. Islam tells you how to live and so on. Yeah. And I guess there'll be other moral philosophies that, uh, you know, tell you what virtues are important to cultivate or tell you, you know, what rules you shouldn't break or uh, tell you, yeah, you know, you might try to make the world more just and have a particular conception of, of justice. So those would be like more formal frameworks that one might choose to decide uh, what, what to value or what to do. Exactly. Although, funnily enough, I almost never encounter anyone who like, views those as their life philosophy. Like, I, would, I, I mean, I think there are philosophers, literal philosophers who are like academic philosophers who do believe in those systems. But I very, very rarely will anyone encounter someone who's not an academic philosopher who's like, yes, I am a Kantian or yes, I am a virtue ethicist. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's interesting. Why, why do you, I mean, part of that is presumably because uh, of the groups that you move in, you've somewhat uh, opted to move in groups that are more inclined towards uh, consequentialist flavored life philosophies. Uh, but But do you think, there's something about those other philosophies that make them less um, less grabbing in general? I think that as far as I'm aware, there is not a large movement to attempt to spread them. <laughs> so like, I don't know of the like virtue ethics equivalent of effective altruism that's like, virtue ethics, everyone be virtuous. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I do think that aspects of virtue ethics appeal to a lot of people. And they're like, oh yeah, I like that. I like the idea of trying to be a good person, et cetera. But it's just like, doesn't feel like coherent and, and kind of unified. Yeah. I mean, I think if one casts a somewhat broader net, then I, I think we might be able to find, for example, I think that there are, you know, some spiritual traditions that look a little bit like, like virtue ethics, or at least place a lot of value on cultivating virtue, uh, even if they're not quite as, uh, that's not like the only thing that's going on. And I guess there's, you know, there's political movements that care about justice a lot and have a particular conception of justice where, you know, people can get really, really into those. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think some of the Greek 
philosophies, ancient Greek philosophies were kind of in this direction of like how to live a good life would, you know, sort of have a sort of specific worldview around that. Yeah. Yeah. There are people who identify as Stoics, for example. And I think some flavors of Buddhism would have some particular conception about, you know, what kind of character or one or one cultivate. Anyway, um, okay, so there's two different ways that you can differ from valueism, it sounded. Uh, one is kind of having a more fluffy decision making process or a you know, non specific one where it's like you maybe you act a bit more on habit or mimicry of the rest of society or not really deeply considering your goals. And the other one is maybe even more structured uh, or feeling like there's external constraints on you that you ought to follow, where it's not just about how you feel or what you value, it's about what you ought to value. Is that right? Exactly. Like, like um, a lot of the spiritual and religious worldviews say, this is the right thing to value. This is the important thing. The other things don't matter. And I think that's true of like, most of these philosophies are much more rigid and they're kind of telling you what's important. Yeah. So what are your concerns with uh, the former? Right. So basically, I worry that the sort of typical thing people do is they're trying to achieve something, but they're not really sure what it is. And they're letting all these forces influence them, but they're not being very careful about like how much forces are influencing them, how much. And so it ends up being a sort of not very like self-directed way of living, right? And so to contrast this with values and values and says, okay, there's a lot of things in the world that you value. Like in other words, you can think of your brain as having different operations. Like one operation is like, predicting what's about to happen. Another operation is telling you how valuable a state of the world is. You can imagine a state of the world where like everyone's happy. Oh, that's really valuable. Imagine another state of the world where everyone's being tortured. Okay, that's really disvaluable, right? So that you've got this like basic valuing operation. You can consider states of the world and value them. But most of the things that you value, you don't value for their own sake. You only value them as a means to other ends. And so to, the, the classic example of this would be like cash, like you know, bills, right? It's like, well, do you value them intrinsically? Do you value them for their own sake? Or do you merely value them as ends to other things? Well, I think the answer is clear. You value them as ends for other things. If they couldn't get you anything else, you couldn't use them to buy anything, you couldn't use them to get status, you couldn't use cash to even burn it to stay warm, it would be totally valueless, right? Imagine you're on a desert island and someone gives you a bunch of cash, but you can never leave the island. Like, what's the point, right? So we use cash to get other things, so it's valuable, but it's not intrinsically valuable. Okay, so what is intrinsically valuable? So we actually did a bunch of research on this. We created this thing we called our intrinsic values test. You can do it on clearthing.org. And it asks you over, I think it's over 90 questions about different things you might intrinsically value and it has you rate them. And it gives you a little training module at the beginning to teach you about what is an intrinsic value to make sure you understand it. And when we did this, we are able to analyze what sort of intrinsic values people have. We've categorized them in, and we've ended up finding about 22 categories of intrinsic values. We've looked at for Westerners, where the most common ones and so on. Yeah. So intrinsic values are the things that you value, even if that bring you nothing else. And you're... And I guess you think that many people who are acting more on intuition or habit or conformity with the rest of society, they're missing out on chances to create things that they really intrinsically value because they're perhaps not spending enough time introspecting or analyzing what is it that I personally really care about and how could I get more of that? Right. And I think upon reflection, so let's say you find out that actually you're doing a lot of social mimicry. I think most people on reflection would be like, yeah, I don't really like want to engage in social mimicry. It's not like something I value. So like insofar as I'm being influenced by it, like maybe I should reduce that. Or let's say you like really, really value reducing suffering in the world, but you're kind of just the way you set your goals are just kind of like based on what the, the people around you say, or your parents tell you, or kind of the things that happen to be in front of you. I think upon reflection, most people are like, oh, yeah, wait, no, I really care about reducing suffering in the world. Like, is this goal I'm setting actually going to reduce suffering? So I think when you, upon reflection, you start realizing that like a lot of the forces that are not related to your intrinsic values, you probably should be reducing the effect of them. And then you should probably be a bit more strategic about trying to get the intrinsic values you have. Yeah, yeah. So just imagining what uh, like what, what defenses would people offer of the first way of living where you don't uh, spend all that much time uh, reflecting on your intrinsic values and then thinking through ex how to get uh, much, much more of them? So one objection might be just thinking that it's the wrong, like being so calculating uh, and being so yeah, deliberative about your life is maybe is the wrong way to live for one reason or, or another. And I guess another might be a more pragmatic concern that 
uh, short in theory, really d- deeply analyzing uh, all of your intrinsic values and, you know, doing goal factoring where you try to figure out, you know, why am I doing this on some really uh, fundamental level and should I continue doing it or could I achieve my goal better some other way? That while in theory that might work well, in practice people will make mistakes or they'll find this mentality to be alienating somehow. Uh, and so, um, it, it, you know, in, in practice human beings, given our weaknesses and our particular predilections instead it's actually good a lot of the time to just go with the flow and just just copy other people because you know society as a whole has learned a generally good way to live and you know maybe you should sometimes dabble in this uh, more deliberative uh, analysis but you shouldn't go all in because you'll mess it up yeah i think there's something to that critique like it is true that even if a method works in theory it doesn't necessarily work in practice and you could be worse off trying to use it right and you know We've talked in the past about like Bayesianism, like, yes, in theory, Bayesianism tells you how to update your probabilities. But like, does that mean you should be trying to explicitly calculate using Bayes' rule? Not necessarily. Maybe that's actually makes your decisions worse. And so, you know, I'm open to that. What I would say is that I find that when people start clarifying their intrinsic values, they genuinely find it clarifying. They they start, I'll give you one example. So I have a friend who was very, very unhappy. She was very depressed. And I was trying to help her like explore why is she depressed? And she realized that it's something to do with her boyfriend, but she was confused about it because she's like, he's such a great guy. Like he's all these great qualities. So I had to do this little exercise where I had her list her intrinsic values. And then I had her write down all the good things about her boyfriend. And the amazing thing was that there was almost no overlap. Wow. And then I had her write down her parents' values and they almost perfectly matched her boyfriend's. And it was like, oh yeah. You know, when she saw this, she's like, holy shit, I'm dating the person that my parents think I should be with. Like would have chosen for me, but I'm like super unhappy and miserable. And I didn't really understand why, because he's such a great guy and he is a great guy, right? Like in many ways, according to many worldviews, right? So so yeah, that's kind of been my experience that um, people find it clarifying. They start realizing as they dig into their intrinsic values, they start realizing, hmm, wait, maybe I'm like, should tweak this thing over here because it's like not really getting me towards what I care about. I do agree that you can like over-optimize or, or you know, you can like overthink things. Absolutely. But then I would add, so the, kind of the, the first piece of evaluism is like understand your intrinsic values. The second piece is then use effective methods to increase the amount of your intrinsic values you're producing. And the effectiveness is key there, right? Like if you're using a method, it's not effective, like stop using it. Even if like in theory, it's a great idea, right? So it's like, yes, we have to think about what actually works in practice. Okay, uh, let's let's park that side of things and consider the uh, the other uh, way in which people uh, deviate from valueism, which is, I guess, trying to follow a more like externally or philosophically imposed goals on their life. Yeah, what uh, what what concerns do you have about that? Yeah, so it's a really interesting question, and it depends on sort of what worldview you have. If you are religious and you're absolutely convinced that your religion is the one true religion and all the other religions are wrong except for yours, you know, I'm not going to convince you, but chances are, I, I, you know, I, I do think you're wrong. I think you're making a mistake. I think you believe something false. Now, I could be wrong, certainly, but I think I think one of the drawbacks of like these kind of rigid worldviews is that well, if they're wrong, they're just like pushing you to do something that just is not aligned with reality. So, you know, if from the point of view of anyone who believes in one of these rigid worldviews, all the other rigid worldviews are mistaken and they just happen to luck on the one true worldview. And, you know, the 99% of other people with rigid worldviews are just like doing something weird, right? So, yeah. So I think, I think one thing that's nice about valueism is that it gives you sort of like an approach to a life that doesn't involve thinking that you've like figured out the ultimate right answer of like what's true. And I would also put in this bucket utilitarianism because I, I've witnessed what I think is like a pretty strange phenomenon where I know a bunch of people that say they're utilitarian. Um, you know, often they're coming from effective altruism, but not always. But then pushed on it, they're like, yeah, but like I only think it has a 20% chance of being true. But I still like living my life about like by this theory. And I'm like, okay, but that's a little bit weird. Like you actually think it's more likely that this is like totally false and that you're trying to live by this like this set of like, you know, rigid standards. And so anyway, I think it gives a, you sort of another approach to like thinking about what to do with your life that doesn't involve being like really confident in like sort of the right answer to the life of the universe and everything. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so 
you know, some people have taken a big interest in moral philosophy. They uh, might end up thinking that some particular school of thought of moral philosophy is very likely to be true. And so there are, in fact, objective things that one ought to value and actions that one ought to take regardless of how one feels about them. But let's let's bracket uh, those folks for now, because that would be a, a huge conversation in itself. I think you're particularly targeting this series at people who don't really believe that there is objective morality, that there are objectively right actions in this way, but nonetheless kind of think that they want to or do act as if there there are in fact those standards, even though in fact there aren't. Yeah, do, do you want to explain, I guess, yeah, what, what you think, uh, like how would those folks explain what they're doing? So I have this essay basically exploring, like, well, what do people really mean? Like, is it really a coherent position to be like, I don't believe in objective moral truth, but X is the right answer. Like, I'm utilitarian or, you know, I'm a Christian or whatever. And it's like, well, it seems contradictory at face value, right? To say, you know, the only thing that matters is, you know, maximizing global utility, but then denying that there's an objective answer to what matters. And so there's different ways to unpack what people might be doing there. One thing is they might be making a claim about their psychology. They might be saying, well, I don't think there's an objective answer to what's valuable, but I'm claiming my psychology only cares about maximizing global utility. And there, if that's their claim, I would just say that they're wrong. I would just say that there are no humans like that. I've looked for them. And like every human that I'm like, wow, this is the most utilitarian person I've ever met. And then it's like, oh no, clearly they value like, you know, they're close friends more than a random stranger. And clearly they value like their own suffering, at least like a tiny bit more than like a random person in another country, right? So I think they're just like mis-evaluating their own psychology. Yeah, is there anything uh, to, to someone who doubts that? Is there any kind of uh, undeniable example that, that you can give? I, maybe it's easiest to see it. The fact that they don't value the well-being of all beings in the universe completely equally is implicit in the actions that, that they would take. And also it would just be an extraordinarily, uh, an extraordinary insane case for evolution to produce someone who had such a very peculiar set of values, you know, in, in terms of just like what actions their brain is designed to take. Yeah, I, I think that's, I think both of those things are right. I think also if they just introspect carefully on different thought experiments of like, okay, you know, you can actually either save your like most loved one in the world, or you can let like on average 1.1 people, other people, strangers die that you'll never see. It's like you, you really introspect on that. And you're really telling me you would let like the most loved person in the world die. And like that actually feels equally valued. I, I came up with a bunch of thought experiments to kind of test this. One is uh, around equality. Cause if someone really believes that like the only thing that matters is like the sum of utility, as many utilitarians claim, then redistributing it is is valueless and that means that like they would prefer a world where there's one being that has all the utility in the world to a world where the utility is like all equally distributed but it has like the tiniest bit less total sum and i think almost nobody actually agrees with that i think like you know upon reflection people are like no actually no the world with one being has all the utility actually kind of is not a great world okay um, so what's the alternative kind of move that someone could make to explain what they mean by that yeah. So another move, if you if you think, oh, okay, there's no objective moral truth, but I think I I still live by as though there is, right? Whether it's utilitarianism or some other worldview. Another thing I think sometimes people mean is that they feel logically convinced, like they're like, oh yeah, sure. If I view myself as like a psychological creature, there's psychological facts about these things I value that are not just like maximizing utility, but I'm not logically convinced of those. Whereas I've heard some arguments that convince me that utility matters and the other things don't. But then what gets to me about that argument, it's like, wait, but you're saying you're logically convinced, but you also don't believe that it's objectively right. So like, isn't that a contradiction? What do you mean you're convinced? Like, <laughs> so what are you convinced of exactly? And so I think it's kind of hard to answer what they're convinced of. Yes. So this is this is getting to the limits of my understanding of moral philosophy or meta ethics. I, I think one way that you might try to explain it is that they're saying that I am passionate about this particular like language game or this particular conceptual game. And within the rules that I'm going to establish for, you know, what I mean by right and wrong, I think that those rules imply this particular conclusion. However, it's not mandatory to accept this particular game or this particular framework for thinking about these terms. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And then my question would just be, well, okay, why did you adopt those rules? Right. Now, now, I do think there is a niche philosophical view that tries to defend this. But I, the thing is, the reason I don't kind of address it too much is just because I think almost nobody believes it. But like when I've talked to philosophers about this, they will sometimes bring it up, which is that there is a philosophical view that says there's not an objective right answer, 
But like, because of facts about the world, all rational agents who like, you know, had enough information would all come to the same conclusion about what's right to do. I see. And so this kind of view, because very few people believe it, like, I don't think that's really what's driving their behavior, but like some people think this is true. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, what in general would you say to folks who are kind of thinking or living this way now that they that they don't really that they don't really believe that there's something that objective that they have to do, but nonetheless they're trying to fit their life into the strictures of a particular moral philosophy? Yeah, what I would say first of all, I would try to introspect on what you actually value and see if you really do value all beings equally. If you really put zero value on equality, if you really put zero value on truth, like you'd be happy to have a world where everyone's like completely deluded. Everyone's happy because they think they're winning the Nobel Prize every moment. In fact, nobody's winning the Nobel Prize and they're just like totally tricked. And they tricked against their will. Like everyone was forced into these machines that delude them because you know they'd be happier. Like, is that actually, according to your values, a better world? And I would say that most people, they do the careful introspection, they realize that they, okay, they do have these, they do have these psychological values that differ from this, this sort of like rigid rule-based system that they um, think is, is the answer to these questions. Yeah. I could imagine someone saying, so on, on your worldview on, on valueism, there's no, uh, you know, objective reasons why I ought to do anything. And so there is no should here. Uh, you know, even there's not even any reason why I should try to achieve the things that I psychologically value. Someone might be tempted to jump all the way to nihilism or just saying, well, there's just like no reasons for action whatsoever. Yeah. And what I would say is there absolutely, there's, there is no should in valueism. There's no reason you should be a valueist. Should either implies an implicit goal, like you should do this if you want to achieve this other thing, or it implies some kind of objective moral truth, like you should do this full stop because it's objectively the right. And there is no, none of that in valueism. I would just say, if you feel like you could benefit from a life philosophy, here's one to consider. It's a totally aligned with what you value. <laughs> so kind of, and also it's like about being effective at getting the things you value. Um, yeah. I also just want to point out, I think there are a bunch of like side benefits to valueism reasons you might adopt it that kind of just will benefit you. Um, one is that I think that people often pursue things that are instrumentally valuable without realizing it. And so like someone will be like, oh, you know, like I really want to like help people. So I'm going to become a doctor. And then they spend like years and years and years becoming a doctor. But then like, because they sort of didn't carefully track the difference between like their values and their intrinsic values, like they've invested all this time only to discover now like they end up being a kind of doctor where like they don't actually feel like they're helping more people than would have been helped if they hadn't gotten into it or something like this. And so it's like this careful separation. I think, I think, you know, almost everyone upon reflection will realize, oh, wait, if I'm going to seek my values, I, it should be the intrinsic ones, not the other ones. But because we don't carefully track it, we get in these like weird situations where we pursue our non-intrinsic values, right? Another another benefit I would point to is I think a lot of times the most difficult decisions in our lives are when our different intrinsic values are kind of pitted against each other. And I've found it really helpful, like working with friends and stuff to be like, okay, you're making this really difficult decision. Let's actually break this down and think about what intrinsic values of yours are at stake. And once we write them down, I find that can be really clarifying for them. They're like, oh, wait a minute. So if I choose A, it like supports these intrinsic values of mine. But if I choose B, it supports these other ones. That's why this is so hard. This is really just a process. There's no like single best answer. It's really just a process of balancing my intrinsic values. So I think that that can be quite clarifying and helpful to people. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other psychological benefits that people get from adopting this kind of perspective on what they're doing? I mean, one benefit, one a big benefit that I could imagine compared to the life that one might lead where one's trying to follow a somewhat externally imposed set of rules or an externally imposed philosophy, or even, you know, a philosophy that one part of your mind really embraces, but that the rest of your mind really isn't, isn't intuitively on, on board with, is just that you might be much more motivated by what you're doing because you've introspected and tried to figure out, well, what do I value? And that's going to be very related to what is intuitively motivating on a moment to moment basis. And so you'll, you know, you'll get into flow with your work more, or you'll, you'll find yourself procrastinating less, for example, because, because the stuff you're doing is stuff that you uh, do truly care about. Yeah, it's a really great point. And, you know, I don't know of any studies, obviously, this is like something I'm pushing very, very you know, I just released this essay, but it does intuitively make sense to me. And uh, Logan wrote a really nice article on lesswrong.com that was about burnout and just independently wrote it, not knowing about my values and thing. And, 
uh, I didn't know about her thing, but talking about how she thinks a bunch of burnout occurs because of like people doing things that are out of alignment with their values. And I think there's really something to that. Like when you're making a lot of your life decisions based on like what other people want you to do or what you feel like your social expectations are from your culture and they're out of alignment with your values, I think that's really grinding psychologically. Whereas if you're doing something because you like fundamentally value it, I think that is motivating. And it just like has a much like healthier psychological vibe to it. Yes, it's very easy to end up with. Well, I, I think that this is what's going on when people say, uh, you know, I act as if utilitarianism was true, even though I'm not uh, a, a moral realist, is that they're saying that, you know, one part of their mind, which has many different aspects to it, many different ways of thinking, one part of it embraces, like the, the rational analytic philosophy part kind of embraces this, this approach. But then, of course, the rest of them, including like their actual body and the part that cares about their needs and cares about their social reputation and so on, is not on board with this or is only partially on board with it. And you end up with a mind kind of at war with itself or a mind kind of divided against itself with different goals where one of the goals is claiming supremacy and trying to dominate the others and this this does seem like it can create a lot of psychological tension for someone as 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 you might imagine and people have suggested all kinds of different ways of of dealing with this with this pragmatically and i guess embracing valuism is one approach Um, another is to say well maybe on some level you know you think goal x is most important but you should recognize that your you contain many different personalities and many different interests and they should all talk to one another and reach some kind of accord, uh, reach some kind of agreement on a lifestyle that they can all be on board with where they're all getting something out of the, uh, something out of the bigger picture. Yeah. And I I think valuism is pretty compatible with some of these views of like, like related, like internal family systems or something this, where you're like, Oh, I am made of all these different agents with different goals. That's it. Like, you know, I, I mean, I don't think we should take that literally. I don't think you literally have all these different agents inside of you. But I think there's something to that that it's like, oh, wait, no, I actually have like different parts of me that want different things. And it's you can think of it as like I have different values. And and I, I do think that when you try to like squish one of the values and let another value win, often like people find that like an other value starts like trying to come out and it's like actually weird and unhealthy. Whereas it's like if you're just like, OK, no, you both matter. Let's like find a reasonable balance. Like, yeah, that, that tends to be um, tends to be like a nicer, healthier way to live, I think. Um you know, if, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to end on something totally out of character, which is just to read a poem. Completely. Yeah, go, go for it. So Tyler Alterman wrote an interesting essay about how he burned out at trying to help the world. And then Cat Woods took like little bits and pieces of his essay and turned it into a poem. And I, I ended up including it at the end of my valuism piece because I just thought it's like, it's just like really lovely. Yeah, please, please go for it. So here we go. It's called I Dropped the Whip. Totalized by an ought, I sought its source outside myself. I found nothing. The ought came from me, an internal whip toward a thing which, confusingly, I already wanted to see others flourish. I dropped the whip. My want now rested commensurate amidst the others of its kind. Terminal wants for ends in themselves, loving, dancing, and other spiritual requirements of my particular life. To say that these were lesser seemed to say, it is more vital and urgent to eat well than to drink or sleep well. No, I will eat, sleep, and drink well to feel alive. So too will I love and dance and help. My guest today has been Spencer Greenberg. Uh, Thanks so much for coming on the 80,000 Hours Podcast, Spencer. Thanks so much for having me, Rob. This is great. As always, if you're interested, we've got plenty of new content for you on our website as well at 80,000hours.org. Some recent pieces that we'll link to include why you should think about virtues, even if you're a consequentialist, what Bing's chatbot can tell us about AI risk and what it can't, and how much do solutions to social problems differ in their effectiveness, a collection of all the studies that we could find on that question. If you want to stay up to date on our written content, as well as some of the top new roles that come out on our job board, and just in general what the team here is thinking about in any given week, uh, you can get on our newsletter at 80,000hours.org slash newsletter. You'll get about one email a week or so uh, with that one. We've got over 200,000 people on the list these days. And if you join, you'll be able to choose one of three different free books that we're willing to pay to mail a physical copy out to you. Uh, That's 80,000hours.org slash newsletter. 
All right. The 80,000 Hours Podcast is produced and edited by Kieran Harris. Audio mastering and technical editing by Ben Cordell and Milo McGuire. Full transcripts and a sensitive collection of links to learn more are available on our site and put together by Katie Moore. Thanks for joining. Talk to you again soon. Bye.